This episode of the About to Break podcast is sponsored by the producers of the show. Big shout out to Zach and Joyce, Marcus, Michelle. Thank you to everyone who's clicked on that button to become a producer. If you want to become a producer for as little as a dollar a month, you can help offset the cost of producing this program. It is a free program. It will always be a free program, but if you want to kick in a little support, we sure do appreciate it. It makes a huge difference. Just go to the About to Break podcast.com website, click on the Become a Producer button, and you too could become a producer. No, I'm not a writer. Okay. Something is about to break. Welcome back, everybody. Episode 20. Can you believe it's already been 20 episodes? I can't believe it. It's amazing. I also can't believe that we've got our first live show coming up. That's the About to Break live show. Wednesday night, May 10th at the Loft on 2nd in Pomona, California. Tickets are on sale now. You can get your tickets by clicking the link here in the show notes or by going to abouttobreakpodcast.com. Get your tickets to the show. Tickets start at just $10, and we've got some incredible folks coming out. You're going to see entertainers do some of the act that they're known for, and then tell some stories that maybe you haven't heard before. We're so excited to have Keith Coast and Eddie Firth, Chipper Lowell, and myself will be there. It's going to be a night of comedy, storytelling, some magic, some bullwhips, some giant six-foot balloons. Folks, you're not going to want to miss it. Uh, This is going to be a really intimate show. Again, if you'd like to get tickets, be sure to grab those while they're still available at abouttobreakpodcast.com or just click the link here in the show notes that says get tickets and it'll take you directly to that link. This week on the show, I have the incredibly adventurous Noah Culver. Noah is a good friend of my friend PJ. In fact, uh, PJ is kind of the unofficial talent producer of this show. If you liked the episode with Christian Pascal, if you liked the episode with Paper Lights, and if you like this episode, those are all thanks to PJ. Big shout out to PJ for hooking me up with some incredible folks who I'm not only blessed to have had on this show, but also blessed to call my friends now. Guys, we talk about everything in this episode. Noah is one of these guys who's had his hands in just about every different aspect of the entertainment business. Everything from film and photography. At one time, he owned his own production company. He's toured as a bass player for a Grammy-winning artist. He was a challenge producer for reality television shows. When you watch shows like Survivor and The Amazing Race and you say, how did they come up with these crazy games? It's because they had a challenge producer like Noah who was saying, what if we did this? And uh, this conversation is a roller coaster of fun. I know you guys are going to enjoy it. So much good stuff. In fact, this is the record so far. It's the longest podcast episode that we've recorded. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the amazing Noah Culver. You got the coffee shakes yet or not yet? Uh, yeah, the coffee shakes are setting in. A little coffee drunk. We we have a... Uh, I'm just going to use these as like a little back pillow. <laughs> yeah, okay, go for it. We have a coffee shop by us. It's like a punk rock coffee shop, mm-hmm. which is weird. I've never been to a punk rock coffee shop. It's kind of like... It's all hipstery and that like they do all the coffee the right way, but mm-hmm. like they're not... Is it just like punk 24-7? Dude, yeah. They have like the most punk rock. They've got a... Their sound system is just a Beats pill that's zip tied to like a pole on the wall. Yeah, right. Of course. Yeah. But but uh, Tanner, one of the guys who works there, um, when we first... It's like two blocks from our house. When we first moved in, I went in and met everybody and <laughs> he's like... I'm like, hey, man, what do you drink? He's like, usually whiskey. <laughs> and he puts his hands out, and he's like this. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, cool, man. Yeah, I like it, too. What, what about for coffee time? <laughs> what the other, the other half of the day? The other, yeah, what are you doing the rest of the time? <laughs> I saw you got the AeroPress over there. Mm-hmm. That's how we roll, too, man. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah. I, I bought one for the road, because my buddy's like, if you want to make coffee on the road, this is the way to do it. Yeah. And my, and, my little grinder fits down in, inside, so I can pack it up, and it's like it stays in my... It pretty much stays in my backpack if I'm on the road or if I'm like, camping, like it's in there. It's the best. It's, dude. it's so good. People like I'll be like fishing with a bunch of like like rednecks and like, what are you doing? Like, making coffee? Yeah. They're like, Nothing takes that long. Yeah. <laughs> They're still using a sock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta let my sock dry. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. <laughs> hey guys, what well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the stage artist in me that is broken. <laughs> hey everybody. <laughs> Look over here. We got a great show for you. Come on in. Yeah, come on over. Ten cent shows. I'm sitting here with Noah Culver, and we are in Highland Park. Hello, hello. Very cool spot of yeah. Los yeah. Angeles. Mm-hmm. Welcome to the hood, man. Oh man, we were we were just talking about what are we gonna talk about, which we don't usually do, but 
we end up doing. See, this will all get edited out. Okay, great. And we'll sound bright. I'm st- still feeling very like... <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> I'm also used to like... Like, because I worked in TV for so long, I'm used to everyone, like, it's all camera shots. So, like, if someone nods, it's oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. So, in my head, I'm doing extra thinking of, like, no. I have to say, okay. Yeah, three cameras <laughs> shoot. Yeah, don't yeah. Worry. Yeah. <laughs> Forget about it. Oh, my goodness. I remember when I first realized that TV was shot, like, when you watch a scene in TV, they've shot that a bunch of times. Mm-hmm. And there's the, what's the technical term where they're, like, shooting over someone's shoulder? Over the shoulder. Over the shoulder. <laughs> That's what they call it in the biz. In the biz. <laughs> But I remember when I first realized that, like, sometimes you see this, like, profile shot and yeah, the lips, yeah, yeah. the guy's moving his lips and they don't line up. Yeah. Because yeah. they've cut that from another scene. For sure. Or another shot. Or another take. Another take is what they call it in the biz. <laughs> I just, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to kind of tame it down that, for folks who don't know. I remember when I started seeing that when I was like, I can't, I think it was in, like, one of the Back to the Futures and I was like watching it as a teenager. And I remember watching, I think it was like Doc's jaw moving. Yeah. And it was like, movie magic yeah. appeared to me and like right. I, I understood and and I remember being like I like this I like you can fake it yeah sort of but like you can still do it yeah and everyone's gonna love it oh and it, it and like if you paid too much attention to it you'll you can ruin tv shows for yourself I have lots of friends who won't watch movies <laughs> especially reality shows because I worked in reality for so long but and I'm cool with them not watching reality shows. Yeah. But because they're like, you, ru- you literally have ruined every show. Like, <laughs> like, you know, you know, like when you're watching, and you can say yes and just know that I'm going to judge you. You ever like The Bachelor or The Bachelorette? Or like, yeah. it harkens back to like the real world where someone would say something really sassy. Yeah. And they would cut to a shot of their like enemy in that episode. And totally. They would, like, they would look over with like a real, like snap their head over with like a s- little snide remark. There's a really good chance that the reaction wasn't even in that moment it was right a producer walking in the door or someone going to the bathroom oh yeah and the, the the expression was what they needed isn't that crazy in the moment. i've had friends go on uh i've had a lot of friends who have done america's got talent and we could talk all day about the contracts associated with that <laughs> but uh but i've had friends who are like yeah we were filming and they they're like you know we need b-roll shots so let's get you doing some different things so they had me point up at the air and look amazed <laughs> and he's like then i was watching the show and they had one of the performers were like standing at the edge of a building like he was going to fall. Mm-hmm. And then it cut to me pointing up. He's like, I wasn't even there. I've never even met this guy. <laughs> I've been used. Yeah. <laughs> what? I'm a plane. I'm a pawn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, I want to talk about TV because you. this is kind of a big part of your world. And, yeah. But you, you've had several different careers in entertainment and what yeah. i love is when we first you know i talked to you about hey man we'd love to do a podcast with you and i said yeah it's a show about you know the ups and downs of entertainment and feeling like you're this close to a breakthrough and this close to a breakdown you're like i've experienced that in four different areas of entertainment so <laughs> yeah. when did you first get involved in the entertainment industry like what was your well, first exposure to it i mean i'll give you the backstory yeah and like that'll like feed into it like i grew up in like metro atlanta like Christian Pascal. Yep. Hey, buddy. Great podcast, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Christian I, I Pascal. Think it, I think it was episode 10. Episode 10. Episode yeah, yeah, yeah. 10 of the podcast. Um, also, Christian, stop ignoring me when you come to LA. It really hurts my feelings. <laughs> yeah, so I grew up in like metro Atlanta, like on like the edge of the suburbs, kind of near where Christian grew up. Same kind of vibe. Yeah. And like grew up playing uh, music, had like bands in the garage with friends, and like did a lot of like music at church and stuff. And it uh, it started fueling a fire of like, hey, like, I really like this. Yeah. So when I graduated high school, I um, I got into Middle Tennessee State music. Went for music business. Did two years. Bomb. I mean, just completely just failed out. Like it was. I just I wasn't into it. Into um, the business side of it, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I I don't know. I, mean, I was focused on like wanting to play more, like be a musician or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like went to MTSU for a couple of years, was trying to work in, in the business, got a job on the road doing some like stage manager, like tech stuff for Did uh, you have a headset? Like the headset with the mic? Oh, we couldn't afford those. <laughs> no. Tin was, can and string. Yeah, I was yeah, oh pretty much. I was nineteen years old and I was making like fifty bucks a day. Like feeling like a king too, right? Oh man. Uh, first one off the bus every morning, last one back on. And it was really fun. Um, but yeah, like did that for a while and then had some like bands in Atlanta, keep me busy and, uh, Rangers of Viva. What's up guys? I know you're listening. Uh, yeah, this cool band called Rangers of Viva. It was a blast. And then kind of like felt the pressure of, um, 
of growing up and the outside pressure of other people being like, hey, pick a career, like get, yeah. a, get a job, like get an education and get a job. Yeah. Because um, <clears throat> we all know if you get the education, the job comes immediately following that. Immediately, right? for sure. Like look at the economy. Like right. everyone's just doing great right now. Oh, it's just yeah. amazing. <laughs> so I was, I literally, I can remember thinking like, what do I like? It was that. It was like that Seinfeld episode where George is like, "What can I do? What can I? I do? like movies. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I can get a job in the movies." <laughs> yeah. uh, I remember thinking, like, "What do I want to do? Like, I really like helicopter. This is a true story. I really like helicopters, and I really like uh, like photography and like movies." Yeah, I guess be a helicopter pilot, <laughs> or I can go to, like photography school. <laughs> It was like a nine-year-old kid, like yeah. thinking, like I don't want to do. What I want to do? Can you like nineteen twenty at this point? Like oh, I was like yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm probably twenty-two, twenty-three okay. at this point. And these are both viable options. Viable options yeah. for me. I mean, the, like the, the world is wide open. I, I mock it and I make fun of it, but I'm very fortunate. Like I came from a family that was like cool with me doing that. Like Love my it. parents were always supportive of whatever I wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they did like pressure me to like go to school and like go to college and like have a career, but they knew that. That career would be something in the like crazy creative world. Yep. But I had the freedom, I guess, is really the more important word, because I knew I had their support emotionally and even like a little bit financially to like make that decision. Like, do I want to be a helicopter pilot? Yeah. Or do I want to go to photography school? Right. So I chose photography school. Went to this place called the Creative Circus and had a blast, which is in Atlanta. Okay. If anybody listening is in, I can't say enough good stuff about this place. It's called the Creative Circus. Yeah. It's like an advertising school. Okay. And I learned so much about what it means to like truly be a creative person. Huh. Um, what was one of the biggest things that jumped out at you? There was... I'm going to botch this quote, uh, and I don't even remember who said it, but I was I was sitting in a class. Somebody said, uh, you know, give me the freedom of a well-defined campaign. Huh. Like the, the oxymoron of like freedom, but also being very defined. Mm. Like being able to like see a goal... And like charge that goal in the most creative way possible. That's right. Um, yeah, it really changed how I looked at going about things. Because growing up and being a kid, I'd always wanted to learn like the right way to do stuff. You know, like <laughs> have to do it all by the book. Yeah. You know? It just kind of it, it blew my little 24, 25 year old mind. You know, yeah. give me the freedom of a well defined campaign. That's cool. And I think that's it's so applicable, especially in the creative culture that we have now where, you know, because of the economy and because of people aren't hiring creatives like they used to, you know? Yeah. So we have to be able to adapt as creatives, no matter what, I mean, I'm talking like music, film, advertising, anything you would consider creative industry. Like you not only have to be adaptable, but you have to be able to take maybe a, a end concept or an end application and Manipulate it and be so creative with it hmm. that you could take something that's so black and white and sterile and become something so ingenious and creative. Yeah. Like if you can do that, if you can be that kind of adaptable, yeah. Um, like you're going to go really far. Hmm. So I think a lot of like really amazing creatives, like the, the, the cream is really rising to the top. Is that the right thing? Yeah, that's like, right. Uh, like um, because of the hard times in creative world, the people who are really good, for the most part, Right, really sticking around. Also, I think there's a lot of people out there that are that are failing up, but that's a whole different story wow. for a whole it's, different time. But it takes a different type of creative person because one, it's easy to be creative when it's something you're passionate about. Right, it's exactly. Easy, it's easy to take something that you wake up every morning thinking about. Oh, I'm the laziest man on the planet, and that is like that. You're, <laughs> you could not be more true. Like, yeah. if I'm stoked on it. It's yeah. going to get done in like an hour. Exactly. <laughs> right. And then, and then, but it's another thing when you sit in a meeting with a client or with someone mm -hmm. who's pitching an idea, and you're like, "This thing is awful." Yeah. But I'm going to make it awesome. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, exactly. and. That we could talk again all day about what that ends up doing to you when you do that too much, mm -hmm. you know, oh, for sure. Where you're like, I'm using all of this creative energy to put mm -hmm. into things I don't care about, yeah, exactly. But it I, sharpens that tool so fast, it does too. when you're having to go outside of like your comfort zone, it yeah, flex that muscle a lot. You become very good at it, and so when you do get to work about things that you can really genuinely care about, yeah, that much more like on top of it, and you're like, I can't even think of words right now, yeah, I want to use big words because I'm on a podcast. <laughs> It's like the, that's the thing with NPR. It's always like they use some word, and I'm like, I want pause. I gotta go. Yeah, I'm Google. gonna go. Do you, do you do this though? You have to hit the microphone button because you don't know how to spell it either. <laughs>
It's so <laughs> you bad. Say it and it goes <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. Did did you mean? Of course I did. Doubles. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank, thanks that for not making injury. me feel bad, Siri. Yeah. No suggestions on spelling crap. Yeah. I was Margar- I can never spell margarita right the first time, so I always have to be like, do you want to go get uh, yeah. margaritas? I was going to say, <laughs> I love that there's so many times you have to type margarita. <laughs> that this has become a big problem. I do the same thing with... Well, re- this with, is Southern California. I do the same thing with restaurant. Like, I can never spell that word. Oh, me. Yeah. And I can't retain... I'll try to like, okay, I'm going to learn today how to spell restaurant. It's and I stick. will, and will yeah. never, every time. Something happened. The, oh, a friend has this, uh, this had this 90, 80s and 90s country night at Harvard and Stone in Hollywood okay. for February. I'm, I'm thinking of 80s and 90s country music. Right. Like, totally. George yeah. Strait. Oh, yeah. Tim McGraw, when Shania. Con- when country was country. When country? Right. <laughs> right. Arguably. Arguably. I mean, yeah. all first name artists. Yeah. Alan, George, <laughs> Tim. You know. Yeah. Now country is all like two first names, Luke Bryan. Like, like it's always like, you know, it's like, like, like the formula. It's like, right, right, right. All right, like the, like the dice they use to name bands, you totally. know, now, yeah, yeah. now they just took the two first name dice and <laughs> it's like, like a hipster restaurants. It, like it's an and. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Salt and flask or something like that. <laughs> totally. Just two random words totally. that don't belong together. With the cool X logo. That's oh yeah. Cool. The cool. Everyone's got the same X logo and you know, you're like, they're going to have shirts. Charcuterie. They're gonna. Is that how you say that word? Charcuterie. It's like cured meats. Charcuterie. Sh- what is it called? Sh- charcuterie, I believe. Charcuterie. Shark yeah, charcuterie. Hold on. Are we gonna hit the mic button on our phone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's gonna be super organic. It's great. It's so good. So um, you. So you're at school. Oh yeah. yeah and and, and you school. hear this quote, and this changes mm-hmm. your perspective. Yeah. Among many other um, things. Yeah. That being one of the more notable uh, ones. It just and. and and if I can say, like, a really close second would be being around that many, just that quantity of unbelievably creative-minded people when you, on a daily basis, yep. not even a daily, multiple right. times a day, when you see even sketches, even, like, doodles people would do, like, they had this problem where people would, like, doodle on the walls in the bathroom, yeah. but it wasn't, like, graffiti. It was, yeah. like, legitimate, like, like, really rad doodles, and they, yeah. the administration you draw, wanted, right? Yes, draw. Okay, yes. I worked at a preschool, and when people doodled on the wall, it was something different. <laughs> you have to get bleach lights. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now they doodled on the wall again. Dang it. They get uh, it that high. And, like, the administrator wanted them to quit, but we're, like, creative school, so we're not going to quit, you know? Yeah. Uh, just like even like the little things people were just like popping up seeing that multiple times a day how creative these people were in every mm. aspect of their life was so encouraging to me to like like I'm not like because I think this is so amazing and because I see the value in this right it sounds cliche but it was like I'm not I'm not weird like, yeah. I'm not different like I, I grew up not being around a lot of that and like it was a very like living in the suburbs where I lived growing up it was like um, you know, you just kind of, you did the thing you did like, like you, right. you went to high school, you went to college for a couple of years. You probably met somebody, right. like got married, got a, like a nice job and like had a cool house and like had some kids and like just enjoyed being with your family and like doing life that way. Yeah. But it never like 100% clicked for me. Yeah. I always had like this feeling of like, this is really nice. Right. But I, I don't know that it's for me. And so I felt a and little... you feel like a misfit until yeah. you get around other people who are like-minded. Yeah. And it was never a negative thing. I never was like looked down upon or like shunned because of it. Except for in sixth grade. What happened in sixth grade? <laughs> my mom. <laughs> this kid, like we had this like parent-teacher conference. Oh, my mom's going to laugh so hard. By the way, mom, I want you to know that uh, I'm really sorry for anything you're going to hear in this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I say some words you don't approve of. Yeah. Um, yeah, this kid was like making fun of me and like, we had a parent teacher conference and we're like walking down this like long hall and all the kids in my grade were sitting on the hall. Yeah. And as we're walking in, this kid was like yelling at just making fun of me. And he was like, everybody actually kind of was. Uh, sixth grade wasn't a good year. 96 was, was a bad It's a tough year time, that. man. Yeah. It's, it's a like, tough time. It, because you're still, you're still down to play G.I. Joe's. But you also right. recognize girls differently. Totally. And That's you start a to hear, weird And thing. you start to hear, like, weird music for the first time, too. <laughs> like, you hit middle school, and, like, your friend has a tape that, like, his older brother gave him. Oh, dude, and I love like, it. You know your parents don't want you to listen to this. But right. you're going to go, like, like, what is rap? 
Oh, dude. This is weird. I remember my first cassette tape I ever got was, remember when they have cassette singles? Mm -hmm. So it'd be like the song and then you'd flip it over. Oh, yeah. Because that's all you could fit on it. And you'd flip <laughs> it over and on the other side it was like the the instrumental version. Yeah, totally. I had the cassette tape of Whoop, There It Is. Oh. And I was just like. Do you still I, have it? I probably am, There's probably a box in my parents' basement. <laughs> totally. That's got. I wish I still had all that stuff, Dude, man. It's classic. Dude. What did you do? You just like put on the instrumental side, like try to rap with it or something? Oh, yeah, dude. Did I had to, I had a, uh, like fifth, sixth grade, I had a MC Hammer came out with this microphone that had a tape deck in it. It was like the Talk Boy. I remember that. Remember the yeah, 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 yeah. And then like the MC Hammer version of it. <laughs> and I'd put my whoop, there it is. And I would just go to town singing, yeah, whoop, sure. there it is, man. You know what? Your karaoke skills are probably on point now because of it. Like, you could probably bring down the house. I don't a know, bit. man. I haven't sang the song in a while. Maybe mm -hmm. we'll end the show with. There's a, bowling, <laughs> there's a bowling alley six blocks away that does karaoke. If they're open, we, karaoke's on. We should go over there we, we go. at like noon on a <laughs> Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. like, Dude, I need seven beers. Yeah. And I need you to queue up Whoop. There, whoop, it, is. there it is. <laughs> right now. <laughs> Bro, we'll sing it upside down and inside, inside out. out. I'm going to show all you folks what it's, it's all, all about. about. <laughs> Remember the next line. So anyway, so we're going down the my mom's like this kid's making fun of me and like we're walking down the hall and um uh, like have the parent teacher conference. Apparently the story goes, my mom leaves and I stay in the class because it's you know homeroom's about to start. Right. And she like sees this one kid and just walks up to him and just looks him right in the eye, doesn't say a word, and like just rears back and like kicks his leg as hard as she can. Your mom? Yeah, my mom did. Assaulted yeah. a child? Assaulted a child. Now I, we haven't had the conversation about how old we are because Right. I look 10 years older than I am, and you probably uh, look 10 yeah. years younger than you are. So, yeah, Exactly. I'm, uh, I'll am i be 33 next week. Okay. I'm, I'm 36. Right, right, right. So somewhere around the same time it was. Frame. It was 96. And, and all honesty, my mom's kick probably wasn't a big deal. Yeah. Th well, this is back when you could kick someone else's kid. <laughs> kid and people would be like, yeah. you tell them about it. And they'd be like, oh, thanks. I wasn't there to do it myself. <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you probably deserve it. Too. Yeah. That execute you on the news today if you for spank sure. a child. So. Yeah, for sure. So <laughs> my mom... Just she just saw red and like, and like, I'm, like I'm her baby boy. Like I'm like, at the at the time I was like unbelievably embarrassed. Yeah. But now I'm like really still. I haven't I haven't even thought about that in years. I can't believe that. That's amazing. It's a great. It's, she did the sweep the leg move from Karate Kid. Put totally. <laughs> him in a body bag. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so creative school film graduated from. Um, Creative circus, yeah, like commercial photography, image stuff, and uh, had a <clears throat> I'd gotten this weird offer right as school was wrapping up. Uh, all the guys, I don't know if you're familiar very much with the Christian music world, yeah, um, but a lot of the like passion, yeah, uh, like Chris Tomlin and Matt Redman, and this is a world that doesn't. Uh, d people who didn't grow up in the have church have no, no idea clue. but man right, I was right. like a VBS kid from the time I for was sure. like 7 yeah for sure you go to your VBS then you go to the VBS down the street so mom can have some extra time to herself <laughs> yeah, mother's morning out you know uh, they were all like moving to Atlanta and um, I think somehow um, Matt Redman yeah. was putting a band together because he was moving to Atlanta and uh Je I had a buddy named Jesse who played bass for one of the other artists on the label kind of got me on the short list anyway Matt um, asked me to come play some shows with him Yeah. so I went from graduating film school and like photography school and having already given up on music you thought this is not already for given up you dropped it. out of the music thing started doing photography right. and then this opportunity comes up comes back around again and to maybe give a little background to like a listener who doesn't know like Matt and Chris and this passion world they're very big inside their community. That's right. A good way to say it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Matt, I mean, it kind of blew my mind. Like I knew he was um, influential. I didn't really understand his level of influence. Like I'd been to a few passion events, like you know, at Bridgestone Arena in Nashville and at um, Phillips Arena in Atlanta. Yeah. You know, big, big 30, 40,000 seat events, and then Matt flies us to Europe for a Christmas tour, and we're playing fifteen thousand seat rooms. I mean, you know. Yeah. It was it, anyway. It was so I get picked up to go do this thing with Matt. Uh, and start playing for a few people and like literally get to fly around the world. And it was an absolute blast. Like, can't believe I'm playing music again. Um, yeah. 
And that kind of ended. And then um, it was kind of back to square one again of uh, like what to do. Like the phone kind of quit ringing. One of the things that people I think don't realize is you you get a, go- a gig or an opportunity. And as great as that is, you still need another gig. Mm-hmm. And what's that like when all of a sudden mm-hmm. it's a super weird thing to go from being on stage in front of 15,000 people and the next week you're back in your apartment by yourself. Oh man, absolutely. So like doing this podcast alone like is actually kind of a, a big deal for me. Like I hate having a bunch of people look at me at the same time. It makes me very <laughs> uncomfortable. Yeah. Unbelievably uncomfortable. And like people listening to me talk, I always, I don't know if it came from that like from a spot of like not totally fitting in with the crowd that I was with. I always was always feeling like I was getting not necessarily judged but always corrected you yeah know? I'm also very opinionated and I like I like to talk a lot so mm-hmm. um, this scares the absolute shit out of me yeah <laughs> like I'm so I like I told you I didn't sleep very well last night because I was like worried about like what we we're gonna talk about and like what I was gonna say and like what kind of feedback like what kind of emails I'm gonna get like it's weird so anyway 2017 yeah for me is a year of like Taking the stuff that scares the shit out of me and doing it and, and doing it. I yeah. love it. Yeah, I mean, so, the, I feel the same way about this, dude. Honestly, yeah. because it's it's one thing. I mean, I spend my life, most of my life is spent either preparing for or being in front of an audience. Right. But but it's different when you prepare something and you present it and you know what to expect. Right. And another thing where you say, okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna let people into some of the thoughts and feelings and stuff. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, if I do a card trick and you hate it, it doesn't matter. Right. You know, like, if you didn't like the the thing I put together... it doesn't matter, but, like, to you as an entertainer and you've worked hard on it, like, you've got... You've got skin in the game. Yeah, you're right. But, I mean, like, and there are pieces that you put together that are are important to you and are, you know... Mm -hmm. But what, what I'm saying is, like... It's different. It's different when you go, okay, this is a part of me that I'm putting out there. Oh, right on, yeah. You know what I mean? If people don't like the podcast... Well, all the podcast is is us talking about what really matters to us. So yeah, they're totally. basically like, "You yeah. suck." <laughs> you know? totally. like, yeah, yeah. You're not alone, um, but yeah. Well, I say all that to say, like, going and being on stage in front of all these people was like was kind of weird because normally I don't like a lot of people looking at me, but I got a big rush yeah. from being out there. You know, and it was cool. And I, re- I can remember Matt being like, he would take us t- a little bit, or, not every night, but sometimes, yeah, and introduce the band. You know. And, from Atlanta, Georgia, you know, Noah, in his little yeah. English accent, Noah Culver. And I wanted to crawl under my riser every yeah. night because I was just like, I couldn't handle like all the people looking at me. It just right. it made me really like anxious, you know? But yeah, playing with, with, with that whole crew was, was really great. Like, I made, I mean, you know, decent money. Like, I was getting by and like, I got to experience some really amazing things. I spent a lot of time like ignoring the, like, flexing that creative muscle in my mm-hmm. head. Like, I'd have friends call me to like play on something and I guess I, I mean, definitely would got a little cocky, I guess, but I wasn't practicing. I wasn't Mm. taking photos and being creative that way. I wasn't doing anything to like expand my horizons or just keep that creative acumen. I think everything kind of dying off was because of that. Like I wasn't the sharp bass player I was when I started, you know, and I would like show up late to gigs and like late to rehearsals if we even had them and like make a few mistakes and like every once in a while you can laugh that off but it probably became too much of a habit yeah and i think maybe that's what contributed contributed to it ending um i don't really know how to like in that section of my life except for like it looking back on it now <clears throat> it was less of an end to the music business and more of like another pause mm. in my life in the music business. So you come home from doing this tour and stuff, and then yeah. you said the phone doesn't ring. Yeah, the phone just kind of quit ringing. Which that in and of itself is kind of a season of dealing with. Yeah. You know, being a creative person without a creative outlet is mm-hmm. very... Yeah, it was really rough. It was... Um, I definitely had a lot of, like, entitlement going on in my head. Like, mm-hmm. this was all great. Like, why is this not coming anymore? Like, I'm obviously yeah. good enough to get it. Why am I not good to keep... Good enough to keep getting it. Yeah. And, um... And you can get so defined by what you do as an oh, entertainer. full on. I mean, even here in L.A., it's like, what are you working on? What can I see you in? What can... You know, yeah. 
and which is great a great conversation when you've got something coming up yeah I'm, not, I'm doing this show or I'm going to sit here. Or I was on this thing on TV. Mm-hmm. And then when that becomes an old thing, it's like, oh, now I'm just, when you're defined by someone who's doing something, when you're not doing something, oh, yeah, for you, sure. you feel like I'm, I'm nothing. Yeah. I'm, I don't exist right now. <laughs> it can <laughs> like, really, like, if you're not careful, like it will suck the life out of you. Yeah. Like, so fast. Yep. So yeah, the phone just quit ringing and I didn't really know what to do. And like, I started to get I was, like, burning through savings and like, <sighs> Start start doing the math. You're yeah. like, okay, I got three more months before. Oh, totally. <laughs> uh, and enter a very dark period and like unbelievably dark period in my life. Um, I, well, I guess not at first really, but didn't really know what to do. Started like trying to shoot again. It didn't really go well. Um, I ended up getting a corporate job. Yeah, which is like the antithesis of what. <laughs> you want when you're a creative <laughs> but it was at what i perceived to be a cool company okay we made it was called casemate we made cell phone and tablet yeah. cases and like really nice it was all internal creative department like really nice folks and yeah. like we all had a blast hanging out together we pretty much had carte blanche to like do whatever we want when it came to like our ad campaigns yep and it was like it was like half grind where I would shoot all like cases on white, you know, but right. cranking it out every day, and then the other half was like legitimate like ad campaigns. And yeah, so it was fun. I was making like decent money again. Yeah, and so it felt good to like be what I thought was successful again, and uh, but I still was like super unsatisfied with mm. myself, and I think it comes back to the curse that you and Christian talked about, like Dude. when you like we have something wrong in our head that we can't <laughs> we can't seem like we see something that is like like the bug zapper in our lives like and right. if we deviate yeah. away from that we just like keep looking at it you know yeah. it's so, so it's beautiful great. <laughs> it's so anybody else on the planet I think would have been like you're an idiot for walking away from that you know yeah uh, I did it for like a year and a half and uh, I went from you know shooting online stuff to getting into video and we started doing heavier video content this is like the early days of uh, vimeo yeah, and, like, yeah, yeah people were starting to do a lot of branded online content mm-hmm. and casemate opened uh like a uk um office and so we started doing more international stuff we just started shooting a lot of, like little online videos yeah. which turned into like shooting a commercial like a tv commercial in london for casemate uk wow and I got over there and I was with our creative director, Matt Blackburn, um, who's one of like total inspiration dude for me. Like, yeah, just a badass dude. He's got a couple kids and he's like in his forties and he skateboards and like, it's just, just the most headstrong creative I've ever met. Yeah. Um, uh, I was working with him and this other guy on our crew named Eric Kreidel and Matt and I kind of looked at each other and we're like, we can do this. Yeah. Like we can do this. This is crazy. Right. And it shifted me. I don't know. I don't necessarily know if it distracted me, but it made me like, it lit that fire of creativity under me again of like, I'm going to do what it takes because this, I guess maybe satisfies me on a certain level, but I find that satisfaction in creativity. So I started, yep. I went back to the office after the thing and I was like writing all this stuff down. And like, I remember writing this like paragraph and I still have it in the notes on my phone and every once in a while I'll like go back and read it. Yeah. But I realized like for me, it was less about goals. Like my goal isn't to retire by 60 or my goal isn't to, I don't know what's another good goal that people have, you know, in their lives. You know, have enough money to send your kids to college. Right. right. Like, you know, or, or buy a home. I mean, as much as I like to own a home, I think oh, it's yeah. cool. Like I realized more important to me than goals were experiences. Yeah. And I realized that's where kind of my, like, I feel the most satisfied. And that sounds like such an entitled thing to say. And I feel very selfish when I say it sometimes, but like, it's cool. Like, like I'm just, I got, I have to be honest. Like that's yeah. Experiences satisfy me more than checking something off a box. I have a friend who just last year sold their house. He's an entertainer. He travels full time. And most guys, what they do is they go bust their butt. They do, yeah. you know, 200 shows a year. To have enough money for the to have a house, yeah. but they don't ever see their kids. Man, and he and his wife went. You know what? We want to not spend our money on stuff. Right. We want to spend our our money on experiences. 
For sure, man. And they sold their house and they bought a freaking RV. And now he and yes. he's got three kids. Two of them are teenagers. Cool. They pull a 15 passenger van and an RV. <laughs> My man. And they just. They just go. They right. just go and they, they, they're living life together. For sure. And sure, there's That's challenges right. with that, but it's like, you know what? Yeah, I, so for you to say, I mean, I, I get I get. there is that challenge. Every time we do one of these podcasts, I go, this is such a privileged conversation because <laughs> yeah. if we do make money, we're getting paid to play. Right. But how, why is that any less valuable than somebody who does a job they hate for 30 years so that they right. can pay for a house that they're never in. I feel you. It's, I'm going to say two things. And the first one, I sound like a jerk when I say it. Do it. But it's to lead to a second thing. The first thing, like I go, I'm really lucky. I have some great friends in California now. Yeah. And like some really cool stuff. And like the thing that we love is being outside. We yeah. love, hold please. <laughs> you can set your freaking watch by how many times, like every hour. They'll be like, do you ever, this is the sick part of my brain is I always think, I wonder what happened. <laughs> I don't do that. Like sometimes I'll just yeah, call yeah, it and yeah. be like, old lady fell. Old lady fell. <laughs> sure. so like, oh, that's a double homicide. I don't get scared until if I hear the siren stop, boop, like that means it's close and I'm nervous. Oh, yeah. You know what I, mean? I grew up next to a park and not the best area of town, uh-huh. a little city called Azusa. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you could literally, I never, we never had a set an alarm because every morning, like when it was time to wake up, you'd hear the ice cream truck. Because you're right by the park. Yeah. And then when you heard the ambulances and sirens, it was like, go to bed. Go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Just, this is the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is the street lights are on. Everyone yeah. inside. <laughs> oh, man. So you love going outside. Yeah, it's a little Even outside. with the sirens out. <laughs> even with the sirens out. Yeah, like we do a lot of like adventuring things and like hanging out. and. Yeah. Well, like tomorrow you're doing this Dutch oven. Dutch oven cook off. Tom, I'm coming for you, bro. <laughs> What is it, what is your recipe you're gonna do? Um, you're going out and you're gonna camp and you're gonna Dutch oven cook yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. So we're going out to the middle of nowhere. And we're all bringing Dutch ovens. I'm doing uh, my mom's baked spaghetti recipe, but I've modified it to cook in a Dutch oven. Uh, oh, that's cool. And if I have time, I'm gonna do a, uh, a second one that's uh, Jack Daniel's peach cobbler. <sighs> I'm gonna win that blue ribbon this yeah. year. <laughs> I want it. I love it. <laughs> So you and your friends, you like you like being outdoors. Yeah, I like being outdoors. And like, we tip it. We're all kind of lucky because we have not normal jobs. We don't have nine to five jobs. Right. Like, you can't just so, say it. We're gonna go camping. So we're gonna go camping, right? And so every once in a while, our like weekend or our little adventures will line up with like a holiday. Yeah. And so there's inevitably a lot of people out there because this is their free time, right? And I can't remember where we were. We were driving so, through some really touristy town to like get to where we were going. Yeah. And there was this large group of, of people and they had like, oh, I was in New Orleans. That's what it was. Um, I was shooting this race in New Orleans and we're walking down Bourbon Street. He's like, Bourbon Street is horrible, by the way. <laughs> like, avoid it. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, what are you, why is it horrible? At all, just avoid it at all costs. That's like, so funny. I just had someone else that went to New Orleans. They're like, it's the best thing ever. So give me your, give me your, per- give me your perspective. Yeah. Okay, well, the person might have been there for the story. I'm telling. There's one. <laughs> it's just, it's all like, there's nothing cultural about it. It's mm. all very manufactured. So it's all like uh. crazy loud music. And then want you to come in and dance and spend money, so they put like the pretty girl. It's Vegas. Fun. It's it, it's pretty. People much. are like, we're having fun, right? Right. They right, told right. us this was fun. Side note: <laughs> I'm drinking a beer in the middle of the street. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> like always, the most obnoxious glass too. <laughs> with it's like, like a leash. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> wait, so you can drink that without using your hands? Like Congratulations. A, like, like a like a booze stethoscope. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hello, I'm a professional. <laughs> Look, no hands. Every yeah. time I'm in Vegas, I'm just like I'm looking around and going like, "This guy's probably a dentist. Listen, this guy's probably a lawyer. Like these are really respectful people who are just and that's like." That's exactly the point that I'm like that I was getting at was like like again I'm gonna sound like a total jerk when I say this, but like do it. This is what you work all year for is a week of oh, this. See, yes, you know what I mean. I'm like, there's so much more to this planet. Yeah, that nature and people and culture and experiences are so much more. Then your your week off at Christmas, your two weeks off in the summer. Yeah, you know what I mean. And, and this is that balance you're saying of like uh, be being creative. What was the quote used again about um, the give me the freedom of a well planned campaign, right? right? Because 
well-defined it's campaign. Well-defined, thank you. It's having that freedom in the midst of what you're doing. So many right. of these people, they've got a job that's so straight-laced and right. so by the book, right. there's no creativity in it, right. that they're like, you know, work your butt off to go yeah. one week a year and just right. basically the fun is not being responsible. Totally. Because they haven't had any moments like that of no along because, the way. Because they're very responsible all the time. Yeah. And in all honesty, like... I have a lot of respect for those people because they accept a lot of responsibility in their lives that I could not, you know what I mean? Like oh, yeah. the responsibility to like when you sign for a new car and you know you have to make that payment every month. Like yep. it's, you know, I got, I, I have to respect it because I know I'm not capable of that kind of commitment, <laughs> you know? And I think about it, like, this is what you wait all year for is to do this, to like let loose this way. And it sounds like a jerk thing to say, but like I realized late last year that I would rather have less so that I can do more. Like mm. I, you're sitting in my house in Highland Park right now, right? Yeah. It's a sublet that I found. Yeah. Because I was paying a lot to rent in Burbank. I was writing a comma in my rent check every month. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was a nice house, and I had amazing roommates. Um, and it was clean. It was quiet. But the amount of work that I was having to do to pay for it, yeah, I couldn't justify anymore. Paying for a place you're never at. Right. It's the same with like like TV, like cable TV. Like yeah, I know there's a TV sitting just to my left. You're right. Yeah, um, but we don't have we don't have cable here. Yeah, because I would rather take that twelve hundred dollars a year that I spend on cable and put it towards being somewhere new. Yeah, and like experiencing something different. So I don't know. There's just there's a it's a little frustrating sometimes, and like I don't want to sound like self righteous and like preach at people and like, but I think there's just a we live in an amazing time because we have the ability, like quality of life is at its its highest that it's ever been, at least in my circle of friends and right. here in America. I think quality of life is very high, yep. but I think standard of living is out of control. Like, uh, I think it's legitimately out of control. And Dude, talk about this. Because you say you don't want to preach at people, but the reason people are, have bought into this idea of this is what they need is because... Right. Everyone's preaching them. Media's preaching them. Advertising. Every, advertising, man. Yeah. I mean, that's that thing of like, yeah, it's great that creative people are being able to pay their bills by working in advertisement. But right. what it also means is you have this onslaught of really well-produced crap being sold to you. Yeah, for sure. It's the Tommy boy. You know, I can take yeah. a dump in a box and put a guarantee on it. Like, <laughs> they've told you this is yeah. what... Yeah, it's like, this is what you need. Yeah, for sure. Like... I saw some a friend on Facebook the other day posted um, about apparently there's this new ad campaign with Disney. It's uh, for um, oh we're gonna so get sued for this. No, it's <laughs> for, for Disney and allegedly. Was, allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. <laughs> uh, for I guess they're calling Kinder Moons, where like you take your about to be kindergartner to Disney World before they start kindergarten. Kinder Moon, like a honeymoon with your child, right? Kinder Moon. Or okay. kind of like, like Baby Moon, how like a couple will yeah, take yeah, one yeah. last vacation before the baby's born. Okay. But they're calling it a Kinder Moon. So oh, you okay. take your preschooler about to start kindergarten to Disney World. Genius ad campaign because as she wrote in the Facebook thing, now my daughter wants to go to Disney World. Mm. <laughs> and like, yeah, it's great. Like, great move, Disney. Like, that's for sure. Like, you're... Which was a great experience that one person had and was able to do. Sure. Like, I mean, I'm saying, like, one person was like, you know what? Screw it. Let's go to Disney World and had an awesome moment with their kid. Yeah. And told somebody about it. Totally. And they took someone's experience and marketed it to the rest of the world who's in no yeah. business to do that. Some, some dad was, like, <laughs> taking a picture and on Instagram thought it would be funny. Hashtag Kinderman. You yeah. Know what I mean? Like, birth this thing. Which, I'm not saying don't take your kids to Disney World. <laughs> like, go. take like Some intern who's paid to troll everyone's Instagram totally, hashtags totally. is like... Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, but like we ha- like, I just think we have to think about the stuff that we spend our time and our money on a little more. Like, yeah, like I'm making the same amount of money I did last year, but I'm spending way less of it, and because of it, I get to go to the Dutch oven cook-off tomorrow. Right. Yeah. You know, in the middle of nowhere, California. Love like, it. Look at the stars and stuff. You know. So again, that's my goals. Like my personal goals are. To be outside a lot and like well, and how great that your your memories when we look because I I do think we're all gonna look back at our life and we're gonna think about what we did right. I just think, man, how how sad is it that some people their best story is like 
Well, one time we were in the lunchroom, and uh, Jenkins meant to bring a bologna sandwich, and he, as, he had tuna. <laughs> oh, we all laughed, and then we yeah, right, worked right, another right. 14 hours to sell pencils to somebody. <laughs> yeah, and like, you know, if you're cool with, like, like if your thing is, like, I want to be with my family. Like, yeah. I just want to be with my family all the time. And that afford, and like that affords you to have like a steady nine to five job, right? Like sweet, that's awesome. Yeah, just don't make that your life. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, right, right, right. Like we can't, we can't do that. Like, yeah, we're not trying to devalue anyone, anyone who has a job like that. Like, yeah, for what sure. we're saying is it's it's incredibly valuable. It's just as valuable. It's just it's a crazy time because I feel like we've got all the stuff. Like, it's like it's like the idea of the internet, right? Like we have the height and depth and breadth and width of human knowledge right. in our pocket. Yeah. Selfies. Yeah. This is what we've gone to. You know what I mean? This so. is what we've used it for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Standing on the shoulders of giants to yeah. take a selfie. <laughs> like it so it's like it's like computer printing now is like if like a like three D printing is a thing. Mm-hmm. And it's like I just think like somebody invented a technology that allows you to think of something to write it down on a computer, type it up on a computer, and have that literal thing come into creation. And some guy's like, I made a wiener. <laughs> like, like, you know, at- bro, which, in all honesty, if somebody did that, I would laugh really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I Do you know what I mean? But yeah, it's, totally. like, it's like, look at, look at what we've got available to us. I and mean, are we using it to make the world a better place? Or yeah, are we sure. just, <laughs> are we just using it to distract ourselves from what's really happening in yeah. the world? <laughs> I mean, homie, have you seen freaking uh, Idiocracy? I haven't. You've never seen Idiocracy? I have not seen it. Uh, uh, you need, we're like, going to pause the record. We're going gonna... <laughs> to go to someone's house with Netflix. and <laughs> Right now. Uh, you have absolutely yeah. got to watch this movie. It will. It's, it's going to expand your mind, man. Wow. It's really going gonna to change your perspective on some, on some stuff. It's, it's a classic. It's great that creative people mm-hmm. have resources now to do things like mm-hmm. make make CD, you know, not even CDs, but like to be able to record their music themselves, to be able to film, you know, make films. The learning curve is tiny. Yes, but it's also, I think... <laughs> Which is probably why I'm on my fourth career. <laughs> <laughs> and get up to speed really fast. <laughs> it's, a, it's a question, though, of like, has it made art better or has it... Has it made crap look artistic? Uh, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I was, I, I, you look at Instagram and it's like every business now has a, mm-hmm. you know, it was like it's a curated feed. Exactly, yeah. and it and it's, yeah. I was talking to a friend the other day about that. It's like I worry about like the younger generations, like my nieces and nephews. And like I have a cousin who just went off to college. My first cousin to go away to college. You know, like super sharp kid, uh, like really smart, loves working with his hands. And like I worry about that age and younger, like they like, they don't have anything cool to like tap into anymore. Like we at least like went to like the skate shop and got to look at the magazines and like went yeah. to the record stores and got to talk to the, everybody working there. And I was telling a friend, I was like, it's like really like it's really scary for me. And my friend said, well, like what are you talking about? They have the internet, so the people who really want and like are really crave something cool, they're gonna find it. And they're gonna find it fast. Yeah. So like when we were a kid, think of what we had to do to listen to the Rolling Stones. Oh dude. We had to like jump through hoops because not only Go to your friend's house was who it wasn't in a Christian family who would let you listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody whose dad had a rad record yeah. collection, you know what I mean? But like, what now, is this? We just have Petra and Michael W. Smith. Hey, having the in the Im- real world, man. The, 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 Amy, the immigrant Christmas album. <laughs> oh, it's such a crush on <laughs> But like now, like my niece can look up the entire Rolling Stones catalog on her phone and like yeah. plug it in and she's like jamming. Yeah. So like fingers crossed, the technology is gonna make the cooler that much cool that much cooler. That's good. I mean, maybe just being an idealist. <laughs> like, no, like, no, it's much. good. It's encouraging, man. I'm just, I, I get there and I'm like, I, I get worried about the oversaturation. Right. Uh, I that's mean, a good point. it's a catch 22 because it's like, if it, if, if it wasn't available, I wouldn't be able to have a podcast because right. I don't have a recording studio. You know what I mean? Like, right. so you mentioned like, <laughs> you'd have like a reel to reel machine, know, like right? lugging in, yeah. you'd be like a, like Mike a detective and... from a, like an eighties like, spy thriller. <laughs> like, all right, so tell me, what did the man look like? Rewind it. Yeah. <laughs> Enhance. Tell me, what did the man look like? 
Thank you for going down that road. I really, <laughs> I'm sorry. I really appreciate it. No. You started off doing music, yeah. then you started photography, then yep. you got thrown back into music, yep. then music ends, and now you're still in Atlanta at this point still in Atlanta. with nothing on the calendar. The scariest thing in the world, the empty calendar. Empty calendar. Got the job with Casemate. Did yep. it for a couple of years. Realized it's about experiences for me. And so I was really good at my job back then because it was like all Photoshop. So I was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like shortcuts and like I just crank through it. And so I would just, I would write a lot. So I wrote, um, just like stream of consciousness style, just like get stuff off my brain. Yeah. Cause I was, I was frustrated and yeah. I didn't know why, because I was working in something creative. Yeah. And it should all make sense, but I'm such a jerk that I'm still unhappy and why, you know, and I want to know why. And I realized that it's an experience thing for me. And so it got me thinking about like, well, what does what does experience mean? Like, what does that look like for you? What are the experiences that make you when you're in them make you happy? Yeah. And so I made this little like filter for myself. Okay. Um, and like I looked back on experiences that I had that I had in life that satisfied me. And so I, I realized there were three things in my life that that I really found joy in. One was being creative. Yeah. So I was getting satisfaction at Casemate through that, but. There was still something missing, so I knew I had other, other things, other blanks to fill in. So creativity and uh, travel really just yeah. got me going, you know. And I had that with, with playing music. I was traveling all over the world. Yeah. And I was being creative because I was playing music, you know. Uh, and then the third was philanthropy. Like I loved like helping and giving. So, like I went to, um, I had some friends uh, when the earthquake happened in Haiti. Mm-hmm. We went down to, like a couple of days later maybe like a week later and we're doing like humanitarian aid work yeah. and probably not one of probably the craziest experience of my life but for sure I mean I was it's one of the biggest disasters in modern times if my memory so like yeah. hundreds of thousands of people died Yeah, um, and we were like boots on the ground yeah, um, handing out food delivering food uh, we you know find a rent like literally found like a random person buried in a house one time and like pulled her out and like got her to Doctors Without Borders and like it was just crazy. So, anyway, so I figured out like those three things were really important to me. So, so everything I did from then on out, I filtered through those. Yeah. Like, is it? Um, is it creative? Is it creative? Is it? Am I traveling? Yeah. Is it philanthropic? Are and, you? You know. And so, like, if I could get two of the three, I'm stoked. If I could get mm. all three in one trip, like, fantastic. You know? Yeah. Uh, so I left Casey. I quit, and I started my own company called Headdress Films, and it tanked. <laughs> Like, what was the thought when you said, "Okay, this is it. I'm gonna parachute into the filmmaking." Right. I. What, what was your? Well, my thought was, I know these three things make me happy. Yeah. And I'd just been in London. Yeah. And I hate to break it to you, America. We're not exactly the most creative country on the planet. You travel and you get to see the way other countries do things that are maybe like culturally a little more progressive than we are. Right. And um, online content, like branded online content, was yep. just really starting to kick in. Mm. So like basically like non broadcast so like like little video content like in a store of like people like wearing the clothes and then like moving and like whatever or yeah. little videos you would get like little online advertisements whatever was really starting to kick in there so my idea was headdress films we're gonna do that we're gonna be the first people on the east coast to like really do it yeah um, and I was horrible I mean like the stuff I shot I think was cool. But I was just a, ho- a horrible at running a business. Mm. And it, it tanked quick. Yeah. Like it just knows just the plane has crashed into the mountains. Wow. <laughs> it kind of bad. So and at, this, at this point where you like in deep with like you had like other people working with you or no, you had it gear. Just, it was just me and I had some gear um, and I had a bunch of rental fees that I had to pay. <laughs> Yeah, like a lot of rental fees, and I just didn't have any way to pay them. So, trying to shut down the business and so, like, didn't really know what to do. And this is where the really dark phase yeah. starts for me. Like, it, it gets the second period of the dark ages. Yeah, <laughs> this is like turbo dark. This is yeah. this is country dark. Yeah, some people would say. Um, let's do it, man. Let's go there. Let's get in there. Yeah, like it. It just tanked, and like I didn't know what to do. So, I. uh I started working on just like whatever I could, like whatever kind of work I could get on someone else's crew. So I was doing a lot of like camera assisting yep. and like second camera operating and like barely getting by. I was constantly like a month behind on my rent, you know? Yeah. And, but I was still at least trying to do something that, that fulfilled me. You know what I mean? So it was like, 
it all kind of made it worth it, I guess. Yeah. But looking back on it, not really. Yeah. And I got a job on this pilot for a show called The <laughs> We might have to edit out the name of that show later. Okay. I'll have to double check some stuff. But Okay. You let me know. So I got a job on this, like, skeezy, like, uh, doc, we call them, like, documentary reality shows. Yeah. You know, like a, like a Real housewife style, but even, like, just, like, just way sleazy. Yeah. And, um... It was a really, really tough job. And, like, I don't know if you can tell from my personality, I don't like inauthentic, like, I don't like manufactured culture. Yeah. And it was just a lot of that. Yeah. And so we were just, like, working these, like, weird hours, and it was really hard, and it wasn't fun. I'm, like, legitimately getting anxiety thinking about this story. This is this is the part the behind the scenes of how it's the how the sausage is made for entertainment. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? It's like people don't people who consume it. I think every time I watch a show like The Bachelor, and I think people who are so invested in it because they think this is real. (laughs) It's like no. Holy new. Oh my goodness. So I'm like working, and it's like we're working like twelve hour days, which is fine. So we can pay an hourly, but it's just really rough. And the crew, the crew was great. The leadership was not. Not all great. that, all that great. Yeah, they were nice stuff. Anyway, I just I didn't. Something felt weird working on this show because I knew I was. I felt like I was dumbing down culture because I'm working on a on a documentary reality show that's so often left field. There's yep. nothing good coming from this show. Yeah, it's pure shock entertainment value coming from this show. So we're all shooting like the last thing we shot of the whole pilot was supposed to be like the opening scene of the show where all of the A cast and the B cast meet at this club. Yeah. And everybody's walking in and we're shooting. I'm just a PA. So I'm like, I'm hiding behind a post, like a pillar. Um, and the sound guy is next to me. And we're like waiting. You know, I got like a radio on. So I thought like jump in and like fix something. Like I'm just right there. So I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. And I hear people start yelling. Like, oh no. So I kind of, I kind of peek around the corner and it's, two members of these two different girls entourage are yelling at each other. These two, <laughs> these two really big guys just yelling at each other. And I kind of stick my head back around the corner a few seconds later. No. And I look and one of the dudes has just knocked the other guy out and he's laying unconscious <laughs> on the floor. And I, I look to my left, like I look to my left and the, the audio guy's gone. <laughs> so I look back over to the guy laying on the floor and we were all fed up at this point. The yeah. audio guy's pulling his microphone wire off of the unconscious dude and we all we all just left and I decided like at that moment I don't care what it takes I don't care what sacrifice I have to make I'm not I'm not going to be a part of something that I find uh, that I that I can't support mm. like this and I'll do whatever it takes and I yeah. did you've I, drawn the line for yourself yeah for sure because in this business people they'll tell you where the line is unless you tell them you yeah I mean? yeah without a doubt I just didn't want to be a part of something that I felt was was broadcasting like unauthentic, unwholesome content. So like right. literally like, so I lived in this apartment and like I was barely paying rent. Like at one point I remember I had to take a shower for like, like multiple times for like a week. I would take a shower with a headlamp on because my electricity would get shut off and I yeah. didn't have money to pay my electric bill. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, it was rough, but I'm, I'm just, I'm, I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to be a part of the problem. What I saw as the problem, you know? Yeah. And I got lucky because I got through it, but it was just, it was really dark, man. Like I, I wasn't like good to my body. I was like drinking a lot and like just really sad and like miserable and like wondering why I was doing what I was doing. And it was really depressing. And I made a lot of like really bad decisions in those couple of years. Yeah. Um, because I don't even know why. Yeah. But it was just dark. It was just a dark time. And like, I didn't see any way out and I felt really, really lost. And then, um, I was working on the show in uh, North Georgia called the Great American Baking Competition. Yeah, which was awesome. <laughs> I was like, "Did you get to eat the baked goods?" Yeah, I was just, yes. dude. I was a casting PA, so like, I would just walk the cast around on set, all like yeah. the competitors, you know. Okay. And like, we had them in this hotel, and in their hotel, they all had kitchens to like practice their recipes. Yeah. So we'd like literally, I'd be walking around and be like. And knock on because we take their cell phones away when you're on a show, you know. Right. So knock on the door. Hey, you guys need anything? Like, how's it going? They're like, great. You want some macaroons? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes, I yeah do. totally. Sure. You want some cookies? Yep. You That's know. That's awesome. I haven't eaten a macaroon since then though because I ate like, two, so like two hundred in a day. And a half <laughs> I was working on that show and the supervising challenge producer um, was a guy named Mike Miller, 
and uh, we went to like the rap party and we're like hanging out, had a few drinks. And uh, I remember Mike being like, Mike, I don't even know if you've heard me tell this story, so I hope you're listening to this because I want <laughs> I'd be curious to hear your perspective. Uh, Mike was like, Hey man, <laughs> if you can get to LA in April, I'll give you a job. <laughs> this is like a couple of drinks into the after party. Couple ten, yeah. Couple ten, okay. So yeah. Mike, so Mike offers you a job. Offers you a job. If you come to Los Angeles, this is in February. He's like, you're coming to LA in April. You know, I'm like, All right. Two months later, like, All right, bro. You know. <laughs> so I. That's the one thing you remember from that party. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, this is the part where Noah just told an incredible story <laughs> that will be a little gem to me because we can't put it in the podcast. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> It's all right. Um, yeah, so I just like so anyway. So I'm there. He like offers this job, somewhat drunkenly. So I basically just pack up and like roll, and I get here and I call. So like, you just you're in Atlanta, yeah, and you're like, this is February, and two months later, you're like, okay, yeah. You load up the car and you drive to Los Angeles. Yeah, go to Los Angeles to like. take a job that some guy offered you, right? When he was wasted, right? And I don't even really talk to him. I just get here. And I call him. <laughs> I call. Or I think I even like sent him a text like, "Hey man, I'm here. What's up?" <laughs> and uh, I don't know if maybe he forgot, but Mike, um, Mike is an unbelievably loyal person, and we yeah. become good friends. On, I mean, we were like, we become friends on set, and uh, he's very much a man of his word. Uh, and I all like I have such respect for him because of that. But he. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't know if you forgot. I don't. I've never really gotten a story out of him. But I think because of the way the show was structured, yeah, and it, it being my first show, I didn't know. But being seasoned in reality competition, now I know. Very overstaffed show. I'm pretty sure he made a job for me on that show. Wow. As a challenge uh, associate producer, challenge AP, and it was a show called Summer Camp on USA. Yeah. And it was a blast. So you come. You come here. You say, Hey, remember you're going to give me a job, yeah. and he gives you a job. He, he give me a job. That's right. And we were shooting in Angeles Oaks, you know, up there. Yeah. Right around Big Bear at this like summer camp and like Jeep sponsored the show. So they gave us all brand new Jeep Wranglers. And like one of my jobs was to go find like a 10 mile Jeep trail to use for a game that we were making. So they gave me a Jeep and like a can of gas and like a sack lunch. And we're like, see you later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, you just took off for a day. It blew my mind. Like I get to California and yeah. it's quality of life and like fun times yeah. it's just through the roof yeah. I can't believe like what's going on because this dude offered me this job wow so I just moved and like that's rad California has been the best thing that has ever happened to me you know and I'm so I look back on that moment of like making that decision in my head like I'm, I'm going like there's something in hmm. me that says I had a friend jokingly say it was manifest destiny. That it was go west, young man. Yeah. But something in me said, you have to go. You have to, like, you, you got to go that way. Like, yeah. there's something out there. And looking back on it, this, like, spirit of, of, of like, adventure that I have now. Yep. Um, was in there the whole time. Mm. And I didn't, I didn't really know it. Like, I didn't know that I loved, uh, like, the freedom of the west so much. But him offering that I think really spoke into that like little fire that I had. I was like, you dude, you gotta go. You wow. like you have to go. So when you say freedom of the West, you mean just an openness to people if you want to go for something that Uh yeah, like like people's like mentalities, yeah for sure. But I just like like the freedom of um like the desert. Like I learned a lot about like mm. there's just a, like a freedom to being out there where it's like a, like like personal responsibility. Like you want to go out this far and be this remote, you got to bring enough water and enough gas, you know what I mean? But you're going to be by yourself uh, and you're going to get to do what you want to do. Yep. And if something goes wrong, it's your fault. But yeah. at the same time, like you don't answer to anyone. You know, that's great. See, and that, that's, I'm glad that you're saying that because there are, I mean, how many people do you meet? It, first of all, I laugh that my wife and I are from Southern California. Mm -hmm. I think we're one of like four people. <laughs> Right. who are still here, still here. Yeah, totally. because it seems like everyone who grew up in California at a certain point, they need to leave to be able to pay the bills, you totally. know, but then it seems like everybody else who's in California, like migrated here to do entertainment or whatever right. it was they wanted to do. Right. What I love that you're saying, because there is someone right now who moved out here from Ohio, who's listening to this, who's going, 
well, he says that, but I haven't right. gotten any opportunities. And right. there is this level of like, you can't just have enough gumption to get here. You actually have to leave the house and go do something. Right. You know what I mean? You you actually have to go, okay, yeah, I'm going to go get a job at that place. And yeah. I'm going to go be like, hey, what are we doing? Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Like, like, I love that you have this adventurous spirit, but I feel like so many people use it, use all their gumption to get here yeah. and then stop and get mopey that they don't have an opportunity. Yeah, man. I can't it's see It's like it. if you don't freaking leave the house, you're never going to meet somebody who's going to introduce you to so-and-so that's going to lead exactly, you Exactly, man. Exactly. There's, I can't tell you. And there's a great parallel, I think, between work and and play for me because I run in, I, I meet so many people who, especially people who aren't, aren't from here, yeah. who've, who've moved here. Um, just like you're saying, and, um, Hey, you know, we're at a party or we're having like lunch with a friend and like a friend or whatever. We're just, we've crossed paths and I'm talking, you know, I'm telling a story about, uh, I like to tell stories if you couldn't tell. You know, we're going to, we're going to end the podcast later with some stories. Some from stories. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to have you tell. At least one or two stories. Okay, great. <laughs> um, you know, I'm telling some crazy story about something really funny that happened to us in the middle of Mexico or yeah. uh, on a crazy camping trip up in the Eastern Sierras. Yeah. And inevitably, uh, someone will be like, man, I love camping. I wish I could go camping more. And I always, I always just, I always invite people. I always be like, man, give me your number. Like, you know, yeah. please, you know, you're more than welcome to come anytime we go. Yeah. Um, they're like, I don't know. I just don't, I don't really have the time. Or I don't, you know, or I know, I know friends, I have, I have a friend who lives in Nashville now who will remain nameless, Jared Romano. And, uh, <laughs> that, that one, I can leave, I can leave that one in. Yeah. yeah. Jared's one of like my like closest friends. Nice. He lived here for 10 years and he never went to, to Joshua Tree. He never went to Pappy and Harry. It's like, he never, he never, I, he flew back and was working and like staying at my house for a few months. And one of the bands I manage had a show at Pappy and Harry's. So I yeah. was like. I was like, grab a T-shirt and a jacket and get in my get in the car. You just gotta it. do it. Yeah, and we, oh. I got to watch his face when he got to the desert. He like, and he, and he yeah. understood. You know what I mean? And but, but like back to what you're saying is like, there are so many people, especially in this town, that have gotten here. Yeah, but in the same way that they're like, I'd like to go camping, but I just I just don't have time. I don't. No, have time to do you it. just gotta do it. It's like where are all these opportunities? Like. To they quote, are. to quote, swingers, one of my favorites. He goes, "I thought they were giving sitcoms to comedians as they got off the airplane." <laughs> you, know what I mean? you can't. This yeah. town is very, very wild west. It's very go west, young man. Still, even though it's very modern, it's wild west in the sense that it is. It's going to be what you make of it, and like you there, might have to put a lot of time in and like eat dirt for a long time. Yeah, there is a kind of a common theme in these conversations that we've had about like the opportunities are available if you just right. keep going like and and do something. Right. So we moved, we live, we live in a suburb of LA. Right. <laughs> we live in Upland. Um got lots of those around here, lots of suburbs. Lots of suburbs, That's man. Great. But we just so we just moved in October and there's these foothills behind our house, like gorgeous foothills. Oh, oh, I know exactly. Yeah, yeah. and gorgeous. and and we live off of a street called Euclid. That's like the main. It's kind of the main drag. Mm -hmm. It was a old. It was actually the trail where people would come into California over those mountains. No kidding. Is Euclid, and there's like a statue that marks like this is where like the women of the covered wagon ages would like bring their kids over this mountain. Whoa! It's freaking amazing. And so we always walk up this this path. And I, I, I've said since we moved in, I'm like, I wonder where that goes. Like I wonder. We need to f just do let's it. Go, dude, so, right now. so yesterday, yesterday we just said let's go. So we hopped in the wow. car and we just started driving. Yeah. Fifteen minutes from my front door, uh -huh. there are waterfalls. Fifteen minutes from my front door is the forest. Especially is right now, the Angeles. The yes, it's beautiful. It's so beautiful up there, man. It is beautiful, and it's in my backyard. Yeah, and I think, how many people? No clue. Get off the job, yeah. drive the commute, pull in their garage, and stay in their house totally. until they wake up the next morning, get right. in the car, go right. out the garage. Just make just a couple, explore the just world. Make a couple hours on your weekend. Start small. And yeah, like, get out there, man. Yeah, and I and I've been amazed. Anytime I do like an adventure, like a little whether it's a road trip adventure, like just uh -huh. let's go to the Joshua Tree for the day. Yeah. Or or it's I'm gonna go oh, to Highland Park. Day. And go to someone's house, right. and we're gonna talk about life. Yeah, 
every time I'm just amazed at how beautiful for sure, man. People in life are when you just. Dude, I was walking down the street last night and I was going to get tacos at my favorite little truck right here. Yeah. And there's a barber shop. I think it's called Julio's. Yeah. And as I walk by, there's a mariachi band inside practicing. Come on. In a <laughs> so barber shop. In a barber shop, like blinds down and everything. They were just like practicing. So I got my tacos and I just like went and sat out front. And yeah. ate my tacos and listened to this band rehearse. Yeah. And I was like, I'm from the suburbs of Atlanta, nowhere, Georgia. Like, yeah. who am I that I get to stand here and eat amazing tacos and yeah. listen to this, this like mariachi band rehearse? Yeah. And like on the middle of a street in Highland Park, Los Angeles, California. I love like, it. it blows, it blows my mind. I'm like, I, there are very few days that I don't think to myself, like, I like, I'm really thankful. Like, I'm yeah. unbelievably thankful for whatever has lined up in my life. Yep. Whatever bullets I've dodged. Yeah. You know, whatever smart choices that I've not known that I've made that I've made. Yeah. That I got here. You know? Yeah. It's freaking crazy. But but every time you realize, every time you feel like, wow, how lucky am I? You have to remember, too, you left where you were to do, right. to do something. Like, right. I, I quote Seinfeld constantly on this thing, or just in life. But, like... <laughs> Seinfeld talks about like people who have made a career in entertainment, like how many people are like, you're so lucky you get to do that. Well, one day you quit the nine to five. Yeah. One day you starved for, for a few weeks, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like there's, you, you said no to the thing that was easy so you could experience You said yes to the adventure. Yeah, for sure. Dude, that's great. You said yes to the adventure. You said yes. You friggin' said yes. Like that's a big thing. Like. A good, I think a good challenge for people sometimes is is when they feel like they don't have any opportunities. Is yeah. just go. I'm going to say yes to everything. Sure. So when so, someone says, "Hey, let's go out," when someone says, "Let's go check this out," you know. Yeah. Go. You know, you're saying yes to a second date tonight. No sudden movements, please. I don't want to scare <laughs> don't. her off. I don't want to scare it off. Don't. There she move. is in her natural habitat. Yeah. <laughs> She's a T-Rex. Don't move. Yeah. Don't move. <laughs> this is when this comes out. You will have already been on the date. On the date, no. I'll update. You might be on date number five when this comes out. Mm-hmm. Or back to or date back. number one. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Oh, dude. So they, so, you, so now you've kind of entered into this new career of like doing yeah. TV and but like kind of the fun behind the scenes. Yeah. What was it? The pudding story. Oh my! That was on summer camp. Was that summer yeah, camp? Yeah. We um, we had to so. There's this thing. When you watch a TV show and you go, wow, that's crazy. I wonder how they did that. The answer is Noah and some guys. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. So, for the listening world out there, I was very lucky for a couple of years, and I still do to some degree. You ever watch the, the reality shows? You know, your survivors, your uh, any, basically any show where there is a game you have to play to either win money or win immunity. Yeah. Someone makes those up. That's a job. That is a job. <laughs> it's a job. I didn't know until I moved here. It's called a challenge producer. So, Who knew? So knows a challenge produ- producer. What is it? Call it. Call it. What uh, happened? That right there would be a uh, probably someone fell down. These little handicap ramps on the sidewalk. They didn't know they were texting. And didn't yes. Know that they, and they're not handicapped. They're not handicapped. But they, they the texting. thing that was meant to bless someone else, is yes. their detriment. For sure. Ironically, they are now handicapped. They are now handicapped. <laughs> Dude, how'd you get that limp? Handicap. Handicap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, I was saving a kid from a burning house. <sighs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I made I made the games for a while, and so I'm on that show, Summer Camp, and there's this thing that happens, and I'm sure you've experienced this too in creative meetings, where when the boss is not liking any ideas, there might be someone out there who just like. No, 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 no. It's like yells out an idea. Throws it out. And everyone that is working with that person in their head is thinking, shut up. Right. Like, no. It's 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 the desperation of I gotta say something. Right. So you say it without thinking about the ramifications of I'm also the person who doesn't just come up with ideas. Exactly. I'm the person who has to produce these ideas. Exactly. So I could be wrong, but I think it was my friend Josh a sale. So to rewind the story, Mike Miller, who I told you about a minute ago, <laughs> yeah. on this show, I also met a guy named Josh Sale. Okay. And Mike and Josh and I uh, spent the next like year and some change working on shows together. Okay. And it kind of became like a team. And it was yeah. really amazing. Like Josh is one of my best friends out here and a uh, really cool dude. Josh, I love you, bro. You're the best. Um, Josh. 
he's he's the guy that I'll be texting like before the date tonight. Like, hey man, what do I? Yeah, <laughs> he's, like, he's like the guy in the bushes, the Cyrano <laughs> de like, Bergerac or whatever. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> um, so Jesus. somebody in the meeting, and I believe it was it was either Josh or Eric Rudnick, said uh, out loud, "When I make human s'mores." What? <laughs> Shh. <laughs> like in a meeting and then the, the boss the boss is mad the boss is like I love it these are the it. worst summer camp ideas ever right. and he yells out let's make humans s'mores human s'mores and we're like no okay we gotta do it so <laughs> so then immediately he leaves and you go how are we gonna make human we, s'mores how the hell are we gonna do this so it's cool again give me the freedom of a well defined campaign it actually plays into this because yeah. we have this just stupid end goal that we're aiming at <laughs> We've got to figure out how to get there. Yeah. Human s'mores. Thankfully, that's really open-ended. So the genius idea that someone in the department came up with, I can't remember who it was, was uh, we're going to get these the big marshmallows made out of, they look like marshmallows, foam. Yeah. They're, you know, five, four or five feet around. Yeah. And uh, the show was boys versus girls. And yeah. so we'll hang a guy and a girl. They'll hang on to these little marshmallows, right? Okay. And we'll raise them. Like in the air? Ten feet in the air, 15 feet in the air, right? <laughs> And everybody's like, okay, cool. All right, let's keep, what else do you have in a s'more? Uh, oh, there's graham crackers on the outside, right? Yeah. So we had the idea of the, uh, obviously when someone falls, the idea behind the game was like last person to hang on. Oh, okay. Be holding on to marshmallow wins immunity. Oh, yeah. Or whatever. The the physical challenge. Right, the physical challenge. Yeah. Um, so little known fact to um, keep this in mind when you're watching reality shows, um, uh, ladies actually do unbelievably well in endurance challenges. Oh. Yeah. So you'll see a lot of endurance challenges in guys versus girl reality shows. Mm. Sorry to spoil it for you. Um, Graham Craigers. Graham Craigers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we got them up in the air, right? And then, like, when they fall, they hit a mat. Hey, idea, let's cover the mats with graham crackers. Okay. So they fall on they, these graham crackers. And you get a nice little crunch. Get a nice little crunch to it. <laughs> And they're like, okay, well, we need the chocolate. How do we get the chocolate? And they're like, oh, the people who've already fallen will give them like scoops and they can throw chocolate pudding at these people <laughs> hanging on these giant marshmallows so that when they fall and hit the ground, they're covered in graham crackers. So they're and suspended chocolate. in the air and people are just hurling chocolate yeah. pudding yeah. at them. So we've got this idea and we like it, but then it's like, oh man, like the logistical reality of what we've just pitched sets in. We have to cover 40 feet. Of mats with graham crackers. That's like a couple thousand. That's like ten thousand graham crackers. If my that's memory serves. And right. this is quite a budget you're working with here, then for supplies of. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then we're like, we need four barrels of chocolate pudding. This is going to be like on fifty-five camera. gallon drums. Yeah. Like <laughs> of chocolate pudding. Like, how do we? And they don't keep sell a fifty-five gallon drum. I just moved drum. to California and gotten this new job that I don't even really understand how it works. Yeah. Making games on a reality show, and I get right. I get told we're going to buy ten thousand graham crackers and four <laughs> gallon drums thank, of chocolate. Thank pudding. God we have Costco. <laughs> <laughs> you have no. So we did all the research, and basically, I was sitting in camp, like at our office in camp one day, and I don't remember who had gone down, but pallets. Of graham crackers, they've gone into Costco and like with the pallet jack, <laughs> just take the whole thing, the whole pallet. I don't need a cart. <laughs> yeah, pallet it, wrap it up, pallet it out, like thousands and thousands of dollars in graham crackers, right? And um, and so we're like, okay, chocolate pudding. How do we do that? So we so we looked into powdered chocolate pudding, how to make it, you know, right? How to do it that way? We looked into buying chocolate pudding in bulk, yeah, like in the big five gallon things. Oh yeah. And it actually was really expensive. The cheapest way that we found to do it was when we went back to Costco and we bought like a couple pallets of snack packs. The individual, the individual like you send your kid with a plastic spoon and exactly. a napkin wrapped around the spoon. So we're like, we'll get PAs and us and we'll empty. <laughs> and it was like 6,000 snack packs into these what? barrels. How long did that take? Two days. <laughs> Two days. Like these are full work days. Just like. I am. Yeah. <laughs> Sun up to sundown, we're opening pudding packets. Oh man, latex gloves on, and then you would have a you get the snack pack, and one person would cut an X in it with a razor blade, and you hand it to the next person who would out. three finger scoop and and then squeeze. <laughs> and just fill it, and it would get hot outside, and they would start to get like coagulate a little and like smell. What I love is this started off as something that was probably hilarious and fun, and about like ten hours into it, you're just wanting like, to no like no one talk. No one even talk right now. 
<laughs> just like military precision, open and putting back as fast as we could move. Just <laughs> dude, it was insane. That was one of my first experiences working in production in California. I was like, what in the world did I get? And it, as miserable as it was, I was so stoked to be sitting in the woods, yeah, scooping chocolate pudding out of a snack pack and getting paid for it. This is my job. This is my life now. <laughs> I can't believe it. Oh, it's unreal, God. dude. That show is insane. We like we showed up on set. I don't think I told you the story the other night we were hanging. We have all these cows. We've rented out. Uh, we rented out a summer camp. Okay. And we just bought it for the spring. <laughs> yeah. And painted everything and made it look like the set. So we had this one tiny little shack that we turned into like craft services. You know, yeah. keep all the snacks. And uh, we had seen a bear in a dumpster a few days earlier, um, like a little cub. Yeah. And people I'm, forget California man. This is in Cali? Yeah, this is in Angeles Oaks. Yeah, people yeah. forget we got lots of wildlife. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> and uh, I roll we have this like minivan that I'm in and I roll like, through the middle of camp and I look in I see the crafty doors open. So I just like turn and look my and like it's early in the morning and I like look and in the in the freaking crafty cabin is a grown bear. <laughs> and I, a, like it, the bear had a uh, a cheese it box on its front right paw and like couldn't get it off I guess no look, looked at me through the window and I swear we made eye contact and that bear thought don't judge me <laughs> you think this is easy <laughs> just want a snack man yeah, yeah. Oh. it was great that was such a fun show man I love that we're doing this because we've talked I mean we've talked about the some of the low times and the challenges right, right but there's right. also fun times working in entertainment totally give me a Let's talk a couple more. Let's get a couple more Noah Culver stories here okay. toward the end of this. Can I? I was. I, can I take like a liberty for a second? Take like, yeah, yeah. Like Anything a, we we haven't talked about that you want yeah. to talk about? Let's talk about that. Like legitimately, when I was thinking about doing like the podcast with you, and I was like, like, is there a point I want to get across? Get across? Because yep. Chris, like Christian's podcast was so amazing. Like when he was talking, and you guys had one point that you came to, mm-hmm. and it really like it encouraged me, and I hope like it encouraged like other people, but like. If there was one thing that I would like could point to and be like, this is the thing I want everybody to know. Yeah. And like if this is all my time here is for, like it's cool. Um, like I had some like really dark time, like when four career when three careers in a row kind of end and it gets really dark, and then I moved out here, um, and I had like great things going on, but I also moved three thousand miles away from my family. Yeah. You know, like it's been it's actually been it's been really tough like I've missed the fire out of all of them like thank God for Facebook so I can see photos of my nieces and nephews and like thank God for text messaging and like no long distance phone calls you know like I feel like we live in a great time if you want to live away from your family but been working in TV and actually kind of decided that it's time for me to fade away from TV yeah and been getting back into managing the bands but it still it went from fun but hard to not fun but way hard, um, mm. and it made me, on top of like working crazy things and um, losing some of the joy in that, and like being away from the family or, and like all these all these other things, I feel like I had like a little crucible in my life, like a little metal purifying thing that like, I really thought I was into like this one set of stuff. I really thought that I was like that these things made me happy that, yeah. that these things were cool and like and these are the things that like that I identified with and like defined with um, and then I get here and I go through all this stuff and like I'm working hard and like money's good money's bad mm. uh, life's good life's bad a lot of free time no free time that like it's all as hard as it was the thing that I got out of it more than getting opportunities and like um, like paying my dues if you will was because I don't care about that anymore. Like that's so like I'm, I've moved on from from trying to be like crazy successful. Like yeah, I just want experiences. But the thing that I learned in that time more than paying my dues and, and getting opportunity was what's really important to me. Like the the bare the things that I find uh, indispensable in my life now. Mm. Um, and I'm like very like I it's. I don't have to even say like, oh, I like camping anymore. Like I can tell you like yeah. having experiences outside exploring wilderness and being outside in nature yep. is something that I cannot live without. Yeah. 
I find that unbelievably important. I rediscovered my love for like Americana and country music. Mm. You know what I mean? And like, that's why I'm going down that road and working in that now. But having that time of paying my dues here and living off nothing and like working really, really, really hard did give me some opportunity and make me successful, but it burned away everything else in my life that Mm. I didn't need to be focusing on. And I'm so focused now on like, you remember how I said before it was creativity, travel and philanthropy Yeah. for me now. It's all it's all experience based. It's either life experience or career experience for me. And if I can't find the balance of the two, then yeah. I'm not I'm not going to spend my time on it. Not because I don't think it's like worthy or good or just or right cause, but it's not right for me in the moment. You know, and I'd rather give that opportunity to someone else that needs it. You know, the fire of experience being this far away from home. I honestly think everyone needs to take a couple years and move as far away from everyone they know as possible. Yeah. It's tough. It's not easy, but it. Um, I feel like I feel more comfortable in my skin than I've ever felt in my entire life. And that whole dark period in my life, I think, was because I was so uncomfortable in my skin. Yeah. And uncomfortable with who I was, that I was making mistakes and doing stupid stuff. It can be hard to figure out who you are mm-hmm. when you're surrounded by people who have told you who you are your whole life. Yeah, for sure, man. You know, so so to right on. discover that on your own, it was a breaking point for me of like. I don't know that I can do this anymore. Like, I don't know that I can like commit myself to this kind of like workload and hours for something that yes, is entertaining. And like, um, people are learning about, you know, teamwork and like hard work and they're getting to see these people work really hard. Yes. There's good things that come about it, but like this much work, I better be like really changing the world. Right. And I decided like, I'm not, I'm not going to do this anymore, man. This isn't worth it. Yeah. You know? So that's when I decided, like, start making the move away from television, you know, and kind of started rocking back towards music business, which is kind of where I'm at now, which is awesome. uh, I took a massive pay cut, but quality of life is like through the roof. Your freedom in that came because you weren't comparing yourself to what other people's expectations were. It's a great point. Wow. I mean, how many guys in L.A. would love to be in that spot? I I mean, a freaking paid gig in television Mm -hmm. is what most people are after. Mm Mm-hmm. I know, and I feel like a jerk when I feel that way, but it's like, I'd much rather somebody else be, that has a little more passion than I. Well, this is, I mean, even when Christian and I were talking about the curse, it's mm-hmm. it's not saying that that job's not good. That's someone else's dream. Right, for sure. We all go after whatever our ideal is, you know, mm-hmm. this idea that we have of what it's really like. Mm-hmm. But then you get into it and you find out that sometimes it's not what you thought. Yeah. yeah and sometimes you get into something that you weren't into. Right. And you go, this is this is it for me. And totally. other times you go after what you thought was your dream and you realize it's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, right. I think that's like, that's what's so important about it is like, you have to know, and it's tough, dude, this is so tough to say because I've been there and I'm kind of there right now and we've all been there, but like, even though you're broke, yep. even though you're desperate, yep. even though you're like a little burnt out and yep. like, feel like you're at the end of your rope, you still have to use discernment when you're taking when you're taking jobs like it's so important to the long not just your longevity in your career but the creative um field as a whole yeah you know if we start plugging holes that we're not meant for mm-hmm. like we're disturbing the force you know what i'm saying dude and it affects other people it's, yeah yeah you know you take a job that you weren't right for or that wasn't right for you other people are you know it's a it's a communal thing right right yeah for so, sure. no, so not only does it affect the team that's working on this project but it kept the guy who was supposed to do that from doing it yeah right on you've, you've <laughs> robbed a friend yeah yeah it's hard man i i get i get though. opportunities for gigs and i go and i know i'm not the right guy for it yeah i've turned down yeah. spots on tv yeah. because i knew that when they offered the gig, a name or a picture of a friend came into my mind, and I went, "He's the one he's for the it." Board, yeah, right. And and it's it's hard, but you got to be able to make that call to say yeah. that's not for me; that's someone else's. Dude, I got a call two days ago to work at Coachella Stagecoach. It would, yeah. it would be my third year, and I'm at a point now with like managing the bands and like the little TV work I'm still doing that. I don't know that I can like justify it and it's like the right job for me anymore. Yep. And it sucks because I have a blast. <laughs> yeah. You know, but like I'd rather somebody maybe who really has their, like really has a need for that 
to get in and, and do that work. Yep. That being said, if anyone listening <laughs> has a job, another job at Coachella, though, that right. maybe fits right. me a little better. There you go. Totally down. <laughs> so I was playing with, with Matt, with Redmond. Yeah. And uh, it was my first my first show with him. We were playing a conference in Phoenix. Okay. And apparently Alice Cooper's wife is a big Matt Redmond fan. Okay. And who would know? I know, right? Right. And that's like, for people who don't know Matt Redman, that's like saying uh, someone who likes AFI is also into like Burt Bacharach. Right? <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. Tom yeah. Jones. Right, 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 yeah. right. I don't know. I like that I, I'm, like, I'm like, Matt Redman, people won't know him. I'm going to pull out Burt Bacharach. Right. <laughs> you know, so, the millennials love Burt Bacharach. <laughs> Jeez. So, I'm an idiot. I'm leaving that in though. <laughs> <laughs> so we get like a call that. Alice Cooper wants to like come back to the green room and like yes. say hello with his wife. Right. Like, like, Absolutely. Oh crap, do I need to have like some snakes for him to eat or something? Totally. Like, like, uh, how do you prepare for a visit so with Alice Cooper? Alice Cooper, I know, right? We need to we need to have a little moment of silence and put some makeup on, maybe? I don't know. So he walks in the door and he's wearing like a polo shirt and like golf slacks because he owns a golf course. I totally forgot he's a big golfer. Yeah. And he was like gonna go play golf after this. So he walks in with his wife. <laughs> We're all shaking hands, saying hello, and really nice guy, just like seeing what's up. And I think like a little bit of when you become that like iconic celebrity, you know that there's like a little bit of like you got to put on. Yeah, yeah. People want to hear like, the uh, stories, yeah. you know. And so he's just hanging out, and he's like, "You guys play golf? Want to come play golf this afternoon?" I'm like what? I'm no gonna just invite him to play golf? No way. And so he starts telling stories about like Keith Moon living in his basement. His wife's like, "Oh, you telling the stories about the." That thing that lived in the basement that would never leave. We were like, wow, they're like, this is crazy. So he starts telling stories about Keith Richards, but he's pretending that he's Keith Richards and I'm Alice Cooper. Okay. And so he's feeding me lines to say. So you're you're playing him. I'm playing Alice he's Cooper. Playing Alice Richards. Cooper's playing Keith Richards. <laughs> I'm like, he's telling a story about. Keith Richards trying to get him to, to, to go have a drink. Well, Alice Cooper was like crazy alcoholic back in the day. And yeah. He's now sober. Has been for like 20 something years. Yeah. And so that's the story he's telling. But he's feeding me lines and he's pretending to be Keith Richards. <laughs> like doing the full on like Captain Jack Sparrow, like right next to me. And then he'll say my line for me to say. And then I'll say it out loud <laughs> for everybody. Like it was unreal that's crazy I'm gonna go lay down in traffic now because I don't know that anything else can happen to me <laughs> that's amazing it's on this level of cool that's so cool dude you know like because you said yes to life man because, yeah because I said yes to life yes to Redmond you said yes to Redmond uh huh uh huh I don't know I was actually thinking about the other day like my granddad or no my great uncle he wrote his memoirs and we got lucky because like they're still around and oh wow uh, like he passed away like years ago but we still have his memoirs around and like, again, it feels like selfish to say, but like, I feel like I've got, again, I've gotten really lucky because I made some stupid and amazing choices. Right. Like, I need to be writing this stuff down. Yeah. You know? Like, I can't, like, I keep doing that thing where I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. That scares me, dude. Right. You forget about like this amazing part of your life. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's a big, I told my wife the other day with this podcast, like, this is not my, it was not my intention. But part of when I first started doing it, I was like, I don't know, I'm in a really kind of weird place where I'm not sure totally what I think about a lot of things. Yeah. I'm not totally sure what I want to eventually be doing. Yeah. But I, I, since we've been doing this, I'm like, man, I love that this weird, funky, amazing, and quirky part of our life is somewhat being doc- documented for my for kids. Sure. Yeah, right on. But like, my kids are 8 and 11. Like, they shouldn't be hearing a lot of these conversations. <laughs> but someday, they're going to be able to listen and go, wow. Like, totally. I get my dad. Like, Yeah, right on, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, right in that moment. And I think it's one of the beautiful things about people sitting down and what's so therapeutic for me, just in normal conversation without a microphone on. Yeah. But but to be able to put out there, like, our stories are valuable. Yeah. Our life experiences are valuable, not just for us, but for other people. Oh, man. And, Absolutely. you know, you encouraging someone with something you went through yeah. might challenge them to kind of get out of their little bubble. Right. And go do something they would have never done. Uh, I got another good story for you. Just, go for I'm it. I'm not going to say who gave it to me, but I was, um, I was working on this TV show, and it was rap, rap time. 
Cool. And so you all buy you buy wrap gifts for typically for your um, rap meaning like the show is wrapped. The show is wrapped. Not, it's yeah. not like a time where you do like hip hop karaoke or wrapping presents. <laughs> it's wrap time, guys. It's wrap time. Rap break. Put on set. whoop. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> Play on the cassette. <laughs> um, it's a wrap gift. We're wrapping the show, so yes. you typically give a gift to your supervisor. Okay. Um, and the host of this particular show yeah. bought every department head a gift, yeah. and then um, my department specifically and another department bought them all like a group gift for the department. Oh, that's cool. So uh, we're it was I think our last day filming, and he rolls up to set, and uh, or she I don't know. Yes. And, uh, allegedly. Allegedly, they roll up to set. <laughs> and uh, they park the car, and trunk opens, and he gets out, and um, hands me a bag, like a, like six Walmart bags together with a card, and goes, thanks for all your hard work. Here's a gift. And, ha- and as what? I grab the bag, there's all these metal, or not metal, uh, glass jars clinking around. Clink, 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 clink. All right. Hey, thanks, buddy. You know, yeah. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh finish shooting that se- segment of the day stop for lunch so we go back to the office I open up the card and uh, it says you know hey thanks for you know hey challenge department thanks for all of your amazing hard work you know couldn't have done the show without you I really appreciate it this is the least I can do uh, to show my gratitude a gift and a challenge is what he wrote at the bottom a gift and oh, a challenge that's cool. I open the Walmart bag Four bottles of like Backwoods Hendersonville Tennessee moonshine. No way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a gift and a challenge. Thank you, sir. <laughs> challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, you know, we may have had a sip around lunch. Allegedly. Nobody got. Maybe one of my more favorite moments on set too. Just, Good people, it's like man. You can have that that really tough job. Yeah. Um, and like know that like you're just like getting through it. But when you get those people around you that like you identify with mm-hmm. and like you're all kind of going through it together and you kind of bond a little bit and like you kind of get each other through it, you know, because you have that like minded thing of like on that show, American Grit, we, I, we, we based a lot of our challenges on, uh, uh, watching the show. It might not seem quite this way, but we based a lot of what we did challenge wise on, uh, on military training exercises, specifically team building exercises. Mm. So I spent, I, I literally spent months researching on YouTube, like watching videos. Yeah. And I kept seeing this phrase come up, uh, especially in like special forces camp. And it was, uh, embrace the suck. Oh. Yeah. And so on, on the show, we all kind of adopted the mantra, like when it really got, I mean, that was the show when I fell through, Yeah, you know, like it was oh, yeah. a really bad show. We kind of adopted the mantra of just embrace the suck, man. Just, wow. we're all we, we we know we know it's horrible we're all yeah. right there with you but you know what? we're gonna have fun with that yep. and they got us through and they're my close friends still you know we still talk and do lunch cause it's LA you don't do brunch <laughs> let's do brunch I'm not a white girl I don't do brunch mimosas <laughs> here's the weird thing white girls do brunch in LA on like Thursday afternoon <laughs> right, <laughs> like, <yeah>. right? <laughs> like <laughs> I am a little spoiled too because brunch in Atlanta on un- any day of the week, unstoppable. It oh, is yeah. the breakfast capital of. Oh, I love breakfast so of the much. The world. I almost love breakfast more than I love entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> like if I could have a job brother, where I got paid to eat breakfast, <laughs> brother, me too. <laughs> so, I have this like personality test that I give people sometimes. <laughs> okay. And it's really fun. I don't know if you want to record it or not, but I kind of want to give it to oh, you. Oh my gosh. Like, we could do it. Are you sure? I'm so down. I'm, I'm like, sorry. I'm just sitting here thinking about how I, I'm, I'm in a bad place if I want a job eating breakfast. I stepped <laughs> on the scale last night for the first time in months and I was like, no. <laughs> like I'm past, I'm like 15 pounds past. Even what you thought you were? Yes. And I'm like, I'm like 20 pounds past at like LA fat. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Which is not that fat. It's not that fat. Right. But it's like, like I can't. Pl- I have to lose weight in order to play fat people in Los Angeles. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> like today, today will be the day. Like we should document this because today will be the day that if I end up being skinny, mm-hmm. it started today. At this point, I'm doing great. I'm like three hours three into three hours a, in three Man. hours into a healthy luck, lifestyle. Buddy. Yeah, good luck, buddy. Give me the personality test. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to text my therapist and set up a session. Set up a session right now. Following this. Uh, 
again, like with like all like the camping like adventure stuff, like we have like I've accrued these like funny things to do like around the campfire. You know? Okay, because like you don't want to look at your phone. You know? Yeah, yeah. So this is really fun to do. Like when you guys are all sitting around at these events, like after in the hotel room, just right. hanging. Yeah, like, this, this is fun the, thing to do. The fun stuff right. after the Especially show. Especially when there's like a married like couple in the room, it's super funny. So I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna ask you four questions. Four, okay. And just oh. give me like your knee jerk reaction, like first thing that comes into your head. Oh man. Uh, question number one: <laughs> Give me your favorite domesticated animal and three reasons why. Dog. Okay. It's my favorite why. domesticated animal. I love that dogs are very like playful. Playful. Okay. I love that they've a dog like seems to care about other creatures other than itself. Yeah. But a dog is also cool to like hang by itself. Like it's not okay. so needy. Right, 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 right. You know, right. and it can go play by itself. Right. But if you play with me, that's better. <laughs> Great. All right. So. And, uh, now, and now the diagnosis. No, or no, do no, I find out later? All, all four yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> your favorite domesticated animal is a dog because they're playful. Uh, they are kind to other creatures. Yeah. And like they're cool by themselves, but with other people's better. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right, great. Uh, <laughs> For for sake for sake of like making you feel better and like for the podcast, do you want me to tell you what I what my reactions were the first time Would I did it? I want the full experience, so you, you can always edit me. it out. Okay. okay, you tell me. You tell me how to go. Mine was the golden doodle. Yeah, I do. I'm telling you, like very specific dog. Yes, yeah, Scout's Honor. This was I remember doing. It was New Year's Eve three years ago in Yosemite. Yeah. We had this cabin and we had like a fire. And we were all doing that. Yes, yeah. honest truth. This is what I did. Golden doodle, which is a golden retriever. And a poodle, and right? A poodle. I'm so glad they didn't go with Poodle Door. <laughs> poodle Door. Right. Which sounds like it's Lord of the Rings. Or Harry Potter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're now part of Poodle Door. Poodle Door. Congratulations. It has been chosen. Yeah. <laughs> so my favorite investigating animal was the Golden Doodle because they're, uh, they get like crazy bedhead. And it's like super <laughs> yeah, cute, it's, you know? It's awesome. Uh, they're just dumb enough that they're always having a good time. <laughs> But like, they don't even know when they're having a bad time. <laughs> so they're just like, this like, is great. It's raining. It's oh, it's awesome. It's cool. I haven't seen rain in a while. Wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> they're just dumb enough that they're always having a good time, but they're just smart enough not to die. <laughs> it's my favorite domesticated animal. It's beautiful. I feel like, I, like, I'm not kidding with you. I love golden doodles. <laughs> uh, okay, your favorite uh, wild animal and three reasons why. Ooh, my favorite wild animal. Yeah. Uh, keep in mind, you can be as specific as... Like species? I don't know, man. I've always liked lemurs. Cool. I think lemurs don't get much play. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, I feel yeah. Uh, it's like the whole Madagascar movie. Don't worry about it. That's true. That's true. But my love for lemurs predated Madagascar. Oh, the fantastic. Movie. Yeah. yeah. It actually was... There is a, a show that's now spun into Wild Kratz. is a is a uh-huh. animated series. But it's with these two brothers. And mm-hmm. it was actually was Zabumafu was the name of the sh- cartoon show. I remember Zabumafu. I was too old to watch it as, as an individual consumer. Right. Right. But I worked at a daycare after school. And yes. Zub- Zabumafu, maybe it's because it got me through the work day. Right. We'd put on Zabumafu and I'd right. be like, wow, I've learned about a creature. Cool. And forgotten that I was in a cafeteria that smelled like poop. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, hey, embrace the suck, man. Yeah. I dig lemurs because they're not like the boss, uh-huh. you know. Like, but they're also like, you know, they kind of can make it happen. Right, you know, right, they right, get around, right, right, right. sneaky, okay. somewhat sneaky, but like in a kind way. Okay. Yeah. Not like those monkeys that steal stuff. Those guys are jerks. <laughs> jerks, man. No. <laughs> <laughs> Lemur like could do it, but he's like cool. He's like, hey, you're fine. Leave yeah, your wallet. Fine. Leave your wallet in your shoe while you go to the beach. <laughs> if lemurs are beach creatures, I don't think they are. My Some, dog, somewhere. my eleven year old, could correct me. <laughs> okay, so you like lemurs because they're the boss, but they don't act like it. By the way, I did the Myers Briggs personality test, and this is oh. way better. <laughs> this is so much more fun. Right? I always hate personality tests because they're like. Well, you're an IHJ. Agree? What? Someone agree? Totally disagree? Shut up. Like, yeah, those are your yeah. options. like these are my options yeah. for life choices? Yeah. And it's like, whatever you answer, we will now refer to you and think of you only as that. We will <laughs> never, we're, we just want a box to shove you in. Oh, this, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah great. Thanks. I mean, you're one. never going to get anything done because you're an I. <laughs> you're an I. Congratulations. Total I. Total I. Dennis? Total I, Total right? I. I keep getting mad lately because like, I keep reading about... Um, <laughs> It's, dude, it's true. It, again, it made me think about it when you were doing that podcast with Christian. It's like, 
I wish that I could just be cool with like a normal job. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Can I tell you something? Yes, and my please. friends will attest to this and they will all make fun of me for it. I wish I could, like, I want to be a carpenter so bad. Yeah. Like, I love carpentry. I love woodworking. Oh, yeah. Like, I have every tool I could need yeah. to work with wood or metal in yeah. my shop yeah. to make any piece of furniture, any furniture you could want. I worked on this rad furniture building show. That's where I learned about, like, really learned yeah. a lot of stuff. And I wish I could do it. I, like, I look up to tradesmen. You yeah. go to the trade. I look up to so much. And I, I hold them in, like, really high esteem. But I feel like the rest of the world... Like, not the rest of the world, but there's a big chunk of society that thinks, like, plumbers just have a crack hanging out. Yeah. And, like, aren't. Oh, yeah. But, like, tradesmen are so smart. Dude. And it's such a skill. Carpentry is amazing. Jesus, think about this. Think about it. Jesus could have had any day job. Chose carpentry. Chose carpentry. Right? right? If I can quote Owen Wilson, you know, <laughs> just want to do what the old J, you know, what better what better just, path than, uh, just than a carpenter. Just want to do what just the like, old J sees. It's like old JC. Maybe you call it a chopa. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I always like at carpenters when they have like the wooden toolbox. Uh, dude, uh, like, what was the guy? Their the... toolbox is their is resume. There... <laughs> totally. Well, are you any good? Well, I made this. Like an Amish. Like yeah. A... The Woodwright Shop. You remember that show when you were a kid on PBS? The what? It's called The Woodwright Shop. Um, uh, it was know. this guy. Uh, I'm going to hate myself that I can't think of his name, but he did like in 15 minutes, he would build something on the show. Oh, that's cool. And he had this. Like, really eat, cool. Eat your heart out, Rachel Ray. <laughs> right? <laughs> Would you make a sandwich? Yeah, right. Uh, I made this table. Fix, fixer upper. <laughs> Suck it. Uh, I love that show, actually. Fixer uh, upper? Yeah. Chip and Joanna Gaines. I love it. it gets, yeah, they get a little uh, little white people on stuff. A little bit. Cool. Not as much as those other ones. We have gone so far off the rails. You know who I'm talking about. The ones that remind me of, like, um, like a young couple that started a church in a city they never lived in before. <laughs> was the, one, one, the, one, the ones that, like, they're, like, a big scandal. Like, they're getting a divorce now or yeah, something. Yeah, totally. What well, are they? The, not Fix Rubber. It's the other one. It's the other one. Well, my friend, the girl. Some lady, right, my mom's listening right now I'm going, it's this yeah, show. It's uh, yeah, like flip or flop. Flip or flop. They my just seem so shit, yeah. disingenuous. Yeah. Huh, right. This is a great house. We'll make an open concept. Dude, I can't watch. And like, <laughs> I have trouble watching reality TV because I know what's going on. Oh, yeah. Like, who stands next to each other, shoulder to shoulder, <laughs> like shoulders apart, and has a conversation? No one. You face each other. Yeah. And you stand relatively close. Yeah. Unless there's a reality TV crew there. And they rotate your shoulders yeah. out about 45 degrees. And then, and then when they have the issues come up, oh. the issues come up, it's like, oh, I don't know if we're going to get this project done. Listen, don't. you make 22 episodes a season. Yeah. yeah. You bought these houses a year ago. Oh, for sure. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it's, people get a certain like tone in their voice when, a, when a, we call them story producers. It's the people who like make story. When a producer tells you how to say something, like, like tell, me, tell me you're behind. Uh, hey, we're, tell me you're really behind on the budget. Hey man, we're, we're really behind on the budget. A little more energy. Hey man, we're really we're really behind on the budget. A little more stressed with the energy though. We are so behind on this budget. There you go. So like, listen to reality shows when people are like, "Yeah, we we can't." And when it gets high in the mid part of the sentence, <laughs> like the like late mid part, you know that they've yeah. had to say it like five or six times. Right. You know what I mean? Anyway, oh. I've been doing a bunch of handyman work. Yes. This is crazy, dude. Do you have a tool belt? Uh, she actually, I was using a bike basket for my toolbox for a long time. Wait, like on a bike or yeah, like a on bicycle. your waist? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you have like a wicker basket, two like shoelace a... <laughs> tied around your waist. Basically did. I had, it's the girl who gave me that bike outside. I had the bike. <laughs> I'm that kind of handy man. Hey, I'm good at fixing stuff. <laughs> I'm here to fix the cobble. <laughs> I couldn't find a fanny pack, so look, I fixed it with this basket. <laughs> It's cool. Yeah, my toolbox forever was, was this basket on this bike. And she, like, guilt tripped me the other day into buying, like, a proper, like, tool bag. Probably so not. Probably not the, <laughs> the first people see when you show up. Totally. Yeah, I can fix that. I got it. Let me just get my wrench giving out tradesmen, of this. Giving tradesmen a really good this name. This old A-team lunchbox I keep my <laughs> screwdrivers in. Quick. <laughs> Jangling around and all the street. <laughs> so, like, been doing the handyman work for this this girl, and she just had a show get picked up. I think it's HGTV. Yeah. So she's gonna have one of those like home rental cool. shows, 
and it's it's awesome like again working in tv a little bit but like i'm mostly like a handyman i'm just yeah. like around it and like it's cool but maybe it comes from my, because i love tradesmen so much but i can't actually do it this like just gets it out of my system yeah <laughs> you know, like purge Dude, we got so off track hold on lemurs <laughs> My personality test. <laughs> yeah, my personality test. Lemurs. You like them because they're the boss. They're like the like they're com- they got the confidence of the boss, but without being a jerk. Okay, confidence of the boss without being a jerk. They're not, they don't run the show, but they're confident and they're not worried about you know. <laughs> Great point. I yeah, show up point. when I feel like it. Totally. Okay, number lemur. two. The, I like the way the lemurs carry themselves. <laughs> okay. Um, I like uh, I like the way they move. They're very fluid in their movements. Oh, okay, got you, got you. You know? Okay. And, um, I don't know. You kind of don't know what to expect. They mix it up. Yeah. Ah, okay, great point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, okay, your favorite food and three reasons why. Mm, this is you can be as specific as, like, dish from a certain restaurant or as general as, like, cuisine. This is really tough. I know, right? Because you I, can't say I one can tell kind of food. you got on the scale. Yeah, dude, I freaking love food. It's like asking me which breath I liked the, the most. <laughs> the last one. The did. last one I took. It's they got me to the next one. Yeah. Because I can't just say, like, you can't just say, like, I like pizza because some pizza's not great. Right. Overall, if I had to say, like, you know, when people say, like, you're going to get one meal the rest of your life, I'd probably go with pizza. Right. It's got most of the food groups in it. You know, you can get it. It's not even for the rest of your life, but like just your favorite. Like, my knee jerk reaction, your favorite food. Uh, my mom's chicken and dumplings. Okay, you like chicken and dumplings? I know. I like my mom's. Your chicken mom's dumplings. chicken and dumplings. Most chicken and dumplings are crap. They're <laughs> they're just amen starchy and right right right. Dr- right, right you know, right. Dr- somehow wet and dry at the same time. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And, you know, yeah. I've always it's one of those things I always, you know, my mom made this and then my wife makes them now and they're fantastic. But it's like this one way they make the chicken but and dumplings. your moms are still better than your wife's. Well, my wife makes my mom's recipe of the chicken and dumplings. Okay. You know. So, it's your family's... Let's just... It's a family chicken and dumpling. It's like right. it's like I love meatloaf when we make meatloaf. I'm not going to go get it at a restaurant. That's weird. <laughs> right. It's very personal it food. It is very, very personal food. Because you don't know what the hell okay. is in meatloaf other than meat and whatever else and they've decided. Yeah. yeah, it's like they meat, crackers, and oh, whatever they've had left over in the fridge they throw in there. Yeah, exactly. You okay, so it, your three reasons you call liking... it me loaf. <laughs> There's the little bit of me. A little bit of me. In the loaf. In the loaf. It's a good idea. I'll uh, So you like your family's chicken and dumplings mm-hmm. because... Oh, why do I like the chicken and dumplings? Yeah, yeah three reasons. Oh, it just feels like like it's giving me a hug on the inside. Okay. Like I just... It's very comforting. Comforting. Um... It's consistently delicious. Consistently delicious. Okay. And I don't, I don't get it all the time. You it's don't like, get it all the time. You're not going to get it at a store. Like right, it's, right, 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 right. It's a special meal. Okay. Right? You like chicken dumplings because it's like a hug on the inside. It's very comforting. Hug on, dude, whenever your food hugs you on the inside, unless it's it hugs you too tight. Too tight. And like then you get a bag of quarters and you're like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, I think that's called a heart attack, right? <laughs> <laughs> My food hugged too hard. Oh, bye, everyone. <laughs> Uh, a hug on the inside. Uh, what was the second one? Uh, uh, it's comforting. Well, that's the comfort one. Uh, that it's it's consistently delicious. Consistently delicious. And always you don't good. get it all the time. I don't get it all the time. Okay, cool. Uh, fourth and final question. Yes. You wake up in a in a white room, no windows, no doors. Beautiful white bed, very comfortable, plush white pillows. Yeah. White sheets, white duvet. Yeah. What's your first thought? My first thought was, where's my wife? When I tell you what this means, oh jeez, you are going to thank me, and you're going to put this on the podcast. Really? Yeah. All right. So let's rewind. Let's go back to the beginning. Your favorite domesticated animal, and three reasons why. So domesticated animal represents how you see yourself. So you said a dog. I'm a dog because they're friendly. Where does this come from? Like, is I don't this know. Sci- is this Scientology or? Like- <laughs> I, I, know, right? I don't know. A friend did it to me on New Year's. Okay. The so. Thing. So. Go ahead. Allegedly. Alleg- <laughs> Allegedly. A dog, uh, your favorite domesticated animal represents how you see yourself. So, okay. so you said a dog, which is uh, very friendly okay. and, and playful, yeah. or uh, friendly and kind, kind to all the creatures. Uh, and it's like cool by themselves, but like it's like if you want to play, yeah, that's better. Okay. Like, I actually think that's very appropriate for you. Oh. Like you seem very kind oh, and like, playful and like, like you care about the other people. 
you know. And yeah. like you're cool by yourself, but like other people's cool. Yeah. Other favorite. Okay. Being alone's favorite, but other people is just as <laughs> <his> favorite. <laughs> the wild animal you said, um, uh, lemur. Lemur. Because they're the boss, but they don't act like the boss, and they like the way they carry themselves. They could run the whole thing if they wanted to, but they don't. Right, right. What right. is they the lemur represent? I'm don't. so scared <laughs> right now. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I can't wait, it's my favorite. Oh! Yeah, so like they can run the whole thing, but like, nah, that's cool, man. Yeah. Uh, they carry themselves really well. Yeah. And what was the other reason? Have you ever done this with someone and while they're talking, you're like, this person's a psychopath? Yes. Yes, I have. <laughs> it's scary. Oh. Uh, so, I like the way they carry, I like the way they move. Right, they're the, fluid. The way they move and yeah. they're fluid and they can run the show, but like, eh, they're, yeah. they're too they're, chill. Yeah. In the words of all my Australian friends, can't be bothered. <laughs> You know? Yes. So wild animal represents how you want others to see you. Oh. So like, you could run it, but you're like, can't be bothered. Like, wow. yeah, whatever, I'm just laying down over here. It's cool though. The wild animal is yeah. how you want to be seen. Yeah, I want others to see you, right? All right. Which I also feel fits you very appropriately. <sighs> I'm so scared. Which is a great look for you. What I think it's a solid look on you. Is the lemur? <laughs> you look good as a lemur. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the lemur, the dog lemur. Um. This is where it's going to get a little weird, and you might choose not to put this on the podcast. But um, Because I like my mom's home cooking? Yeah, so... Oh, <laughs> your, uh, your favorite food are your views on sex. So my you said... Views on sex. You said your, your mom's, but I'll oh, give you going your wife's... Freud? You're chi- going all chicken. Freud? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, said, you said your wife's... I'll give you your wife. Your wife's chicken and dumplings. <laughs> <laughs> is how you feel about sex, because... Chicken and dumplings is the worst thing to correlate... Sexually. Oh, I forgot to tell you what mine were. My favorite <laughs> is breakfast. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, because you can have because there. It's the first thing you do when you wake up. <laughs> it's good any time of the day. Yeah. This is legitimately what I said. It's good any. Uh, maybe I don't want this going on here. <laughs> it's good any time of the day. There's lots of different ways to eat it, and it can either be really, really fancy. You can go like a nice brunch. Yeah. Or you can make bacon in the stove. Right, and it's always great. It's always great. Yeah. So, so you said. Your views on sex or your 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 family's recipe for chicken and dumplings because it's like a hug on the inside. I don't know what that means. <laughs> like I'm an emotional like. <laughs> you said a hug on the inside. Uh, it's consistently good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want that, and you don't get it very often. <laughs> You're in so much trouble. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Oh, that is hilarious. Uh, so good. <laughs> this next one, though, is going to redeem anything that happens. <laughs> so I said, alone in the white room, like, what's your first thought? And you said, where's your wife? That's actually your thoughts on marriage. Oh. So your views on marriage are, where's my wife? That's Aww. freaking sweet, dude. Aww. That's, like, really, like, that got me. Mm. <sighs> Can I date tonight? It's cool. Dude, date number two. <laughs> date number two. Oh, my date number two. Anyway, but that's like go do the personality test to like all that's the wild. Like all the people. It's so much fun. What's the like, scariest answer you've gotten to any one of those questions from someone, and you don't have to say who it is? Um, <laughs> like has anyone ever said something? You'd be like, dude, you are messed up. <laughs> yeah, this guy that I've, I've met through some friends. If we're I'm camping sorry. somewhere, he won't. He doesn't come to regular camping. He goes when we're like overland, like bushcraft, like way back in the woods. Yeah, like we have to drop. Like a GPS pin to get yeah. there, and then like we send it to him okay. with like satellite thing. He yeah. shows up on his motorcycle every time. He's got like an overlander. Like this dude is. He's Mad Max. He is Mad Max. He's just he's a man's man. Like he rides his little dirt bike, and like he's ridden all over the world. Like he's this crazy dude. And I said, um, I said, what's your favorite? Uh, what's your favorite wild animal? And uh, he said, he leans across the campfire to me and goes, humans. That's crazy. He's a here. He wants people to see him as a human. <laughs> what? What's your favorite food? Whatever you're eating. Whatever. You're eating. <laughs> 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 he said humans. Humans. Crap. I was camping with him one time, and uh, like when I camp, if there's no weather, I don't set up a tent. I just do like a tarp on the ground and then like sleeping bag. And yeah. It's like wool blanket over my head. Okay. And so my buddy, we're in. Uh, we're up by like Mammoth. Yeah. Close ish. There's all these like hot springs. 395. Out there. Way up to 395. Yeah. Edit out 395. I don't need any more white people knowing about the 395. <laughs> <laughs> Too many people know. 
<laughs> Look, the, Harold! We were up camping at the... It was really yeah, great. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's so, a place... Up there. there in California. Hear the stuff. They got good sourdough and Bishop. <laughs> Let's go, honey. Did you get good sourdough? What? Did you say good sourdough and Bishop? Good sourdough, yeah. Yeah, Schatz. Schatz Bakery. Yeah, dude, my man. You know what's up. My in-laws live in Gardnerville, Nevada. It's just basically oh, yeah. like take the 395 eight hours and turn right. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Oh, so, so like I'm, I'm sleeping uh, one night and I had um, my buddy Drew... It was kind of, kind of getting cool, and so we knew there was some like wildlife activity. Like specifically, like we had heard about some bear reports on the other side of the three ninety five, like a couple mountain lion sightings. Yeah. So my buddy Drew was going to give me his like pistol to sleep out there with me, and we forgot. And uh, I'm, I'm I'm laying there asleep, and I had this really vivid dream that I run up the steps at my parents' house, yeah. and our family cat like hisses at me. And it's so vivid it wakes me up, but I've got this blanket over my head. Mm. So I'm laying there, and in my mind, that's a mountain lion hissing at me. I, like, I think that's what will actually woke me up. Like The dream came from it. I'm like, crap, I don't have Drew's gun. <sighs> what am I going to do? And I had a Leatherman on me, so I like <laughs> opened like, the little knife on the Dude, Leatherman. Is that, wait, which, which one of these seven, eight, 18 tools do you use? <laughs> use all of them? Wire so I opened a little knife blade. Leather punch? <laughs> <laughs> Can opener? Uh, so I opened like the knife blade. I don't think I went with serrated blade. I think I went with straight blade. Okay, yeah. Open yeah. the knife. And um, my genius plan is, because I'm still totally asleep, Sorry. is I'm going to throw my blanket in the air as high as I can and it's going to distract this thing and then I'm going to stab it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like this, a quick this mountain like, lion. prison shower stabs? Yeah, just shank, <laughs> shank this mountain lion. Right? Is it shank? Is that the right? I think it's shank. Yeah, I, I think a shiv shows. is what you use to shank. Right. You create. You make the, make shiv, the shiv out of like an old toothbrush. Right. Sometimes a, a bar of soap. Shiv is the is the one noun. Right? Shank is the adjective. Yeah. Shiv and shank is one of those hipster restaurants we were talking about. <laughs> shiv and shank now now opening Farm. in Los Feliz. Los Feliz Farm <laughs> table prison food. <laughs> All, all of the money they raise, like 50% of the profit, goes back into um, domesticating um, animals who committed felonies. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Rehabilitating. So he's like a fox who killed a squirrel. Yeah. The money goes to but that. But he's cool. He's like turning it around. He's cool, yeah. He's like, he's on the, the straight and narrow. Um, okay, so back to Mammoth. I'm like, I throw, I throw the blanket up, right? Like, and I jump up. And I've got this knife in my hand, and there's no mountain lion. So I'm, like, relieved. But when it's cold outside, I don't know if you know this, and you're in a sleeping bag, you sleep with as little clothing on as you can. Yes, so I'm, stay warm. I'm basically nude at this yes. point. I've got underwear you're on. You're some so nude guy with a shiv, with a shake. on the blanket, and I'm, huh, and I'm standing there, knife out, and that guy is asleep on the ground next to his motorcycle. And he rolls over, and he looks at me, and he goes, you're in your underwear. Go back to sleep. But the tone in his voice was like, if you don't go back to sleep, I will get up out of this thing and murder you myself. He you was know? like that calm. He was like that calm about it. Like, I just I just woken him up. But the nicest guy. But, like, you just wake somebody up in the middle of the night. You never know who you're going to get, you know. Right. But but it's almost more concerning that you woke him up in your underwear with a, with knife, a knife pointed that's, at and him. I think that's what freaked and him out. And he was so calm. And he was so calm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we woke, I woke up the next morning and told him the story. He was like... Oh, <laughs> like you thought it was a, a dream. Yeah, he was weirded out that he was dreaming of you in your underwear. <laughs> right? He's like, yeah, that makes sense. I probably would have done the same thing. He's like, like the oh, knife yeah. represents your views on marriage, <laughs> and the <laughs> yeah. Oh, that story has no point, but it's amazing. I love <laughs> like, it. Zero point. That's hilarious. The point is, you went out and had the story. Hey, yeah. Everybody wants the good story. Yeah, you're not going to get him if you don't. I'll sh- yes I will shower with life. a headlamp on if I have to to keep having these experiences. Yeah. I'm uh, dude, we're launching, and you should bring the family up. Yeah. Um, I'm launching a. So, I have some friends outside of San Luis Obispo, this little town called Los Osos. Yeah. Been? Oh, yeah. I've been managing. Like, I started, I started this company called War Horse Artists. I think we talked about this. Yeah, yeah. And, like, I've been managing these, like, Americana bands, and, like, dude, it's been, like, super rewarding. Like, I really. Like, I don't know, man. It's, like, hitting play back on you know i told you earlier i was like pausing on the music business yeah like i hit play again and like i'm back in it where i kind of should have been the whole time you know and it's cool man like I, I, I regret getting out of it a little bit but um i'm just i'm stoked to be where i'm at but anyway 
So I've been managing this band called Moonsville Collective. Nice. Like, rad dudes. And it's the guys who, like, opened my eyes to, like, California wilderness. Yeah. So, like, they're some of my closest friends on the planet. Um, and I, I couldn't have gotten through all, like, the hard times without these dudes around. But now I get to work with them and, like, help their this, like, initiative that they're doing. And, like, I don't know. It's super great. Anyway, um, we're launching a folk festival in Los Osos awesome. called the Central Coast Folk Fest in May. Nice. And like, we literally are just like, we're not, no one's making any money off of it. Yeah. Like, we're selling tickets, but like, I'm right. not taking a salary. Seth's not taking a cut of profits. Yeah. Like, we have, you know, we have the guarantees for the bands and then like a split of the door ticket sales and we're spreading it out across every band and then any money that's left over goes to like, I think it's going to go to like a land trust that got started in Los Osos. Cool. But like, I just, like I'm starting a folk festival Love it. in the middle of California. Like I'm wasting all of my time not getting paid, but I don't care. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's 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 just the best. Do it for the love of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like I'm cool living in a tiny like sublet with no TV, living off of bacon and eggs and sandwiches. Yeah. Because uh, that's not important. Right. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I'd love to have another house again that's got, like, big windows and sits on a hill and I can keep the windows open and let the breeze come through and, like, sit on a porch and drink coffee in the morning. And, like, I would love those things. Like, don't get me wrong, but when it really comes down to it, like, without these experiences that I'm getting to do, that doesn't mean anything, you know? So good, man. Like, I'll sacrifice all of it in a heartbeat. I'll walk away from, I'll walk away from every bit of it. I feel like you've just made it an incredibly poignant point and I'm going to make it really silly right now. <laughs> But I have two little girls, and we watch Disney movies constantly. Yes. <laughs> but how many Disney movies start with someone in a castle with everything they got, uh -huh. anything anyone could ever want, right. looking out the window, dreaming of the adventure that awaits uh -huh. if they'd actually leave what they got to go right do on. something else? Right on. You're a princess, my friend. Or... <laughs> Literally, no one's ever called me a princess before. <laughs> Thank you. I, and the most, I didn't. I mean, and I'm my own prince charming in a way. Dude, the adventure happens when you leave. Yeah, man. When you leave the comforts of the castle. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, dude, I, I love my parents. Like, I, I'm genuinely like so grateful for everything they've done. When I told them I was moving to LA, it did not go well. Yeah. Like, it took them a while to get on board. But now they're, like, super on board with it. Yeah. Like, I told them we went and had dinner for my birthday, like, years and years ago. I was moving. Four years ago, probably. Five years ago. And, like, legitimately, they didn't... We probably didn't talk for, like, a, like a week or two. It was really uh, tough. Yeah. You know? But now they're on board. It's, like, it's all cool. It's all kosher. And I, like, part of me is, like, hoping, too, that, like, maybe they had some personal growth by seeing me... And like having to be there with me as I made this like yeah. crazy jump, you yep. know what I mean? Like I don't know. Um, but you said Disney movie, and I I feel like maybe instead of princess, I identify more with the prince in uh, the Emperor's New Groove or the Emperor in the Emperor's yeah, yeah, New yeah. Groove, you know, where he's like, I'm cool and all this, man. I love it because like I loved Atlanta and I loved working TV and I was super comfortable. But in all reality, that stuff really wasn't all that important. But I was blinded. Yeah. by something that I thought was important because I hadn't had to really burn it all away yet, you know, and I had to go through like a really hard time to like burn it all away. Yeah. So like I was the emperor and then I get turned into a llama and then it's like, wait, I love being a llama. <laughs> I'm super now and being a llama. It makes sense in my head. It makes total sense. Okay, great, 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 great. Do you want me to translate that and tell you what it means? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So the llama... <laughs> Represents your feeling about summer footwear. Ah, yeah. I don't own sandals or flip flops, but I'm thinking. See, this is a sign. perfect. <laughs> this is how people make a living being psychics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? Dude, this has been this has been so good. I know we could talk for hours. Thank you for taking us with you on the journey, man. Yeah, let's let's meet back up in like a year and be like, okay, we should we should do an update. Change. Like, okay, yeah. how's it going? You're like, well, I've really got into scrapbooking and. <laughs> Knowing me, probably. Uh, yeah. It's like authentic scrapbooking, though. Like, authentic. I, yeah, none I make of that. the paper by hand. Exactly, yes. You go to the shank and the shiv. <laughs> the shank and the shiv. You sit there and you have your... Toilet gin. Or to to toilet toilet gin. <laughs> toilet hooch in the movies. Dude, oh yeah, shank and shiv should be like only prison food. Like pizzas you made on a tortilla using like ramen noodles as a broth somehow. <laughs>
<laughs> just so everyone understands, this is us copywriting the idea. This is the us. <laughs> Listen, someone in Silver Lake right now has the same idea. We had it first. Yeah, first. You show up, they give you an orange jumpsuit. <laughs> All the waiters and waitresses are wearing the like wearing a, the guard, the uniform. guard uniforms. Yeah, the CIs. Yeah, yeah. The booths are are CIs. cells. We refer to the booths as cells. So, yeah, yeah. Cell fifteen needs water. Yeah. Tell them to get it themselves out of the sink with the toilet attached to the bottom. Yes, in 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 an ironic way that only hipsters can appreciate. Uh, everything's going to be priced over twenty dollars at the prison. <laughs> Also, not trying to belittle anyone that's in prison. People make mistakes. We get it. Or hipsters. Well, we should hipsters. just end the show by apologizing to all the people we have been <laughs> Princesses. That is, <laughs> princesses. That's <sighs> tapping into some fear deep down in me now. That's why I'm so nervous. You're going to get a knock on a door. It's going to be Rapunzel and a couple hipsters. And You're right. <laughs> Serenity now. Serenity now. Well, thanks for um, hanging. Thanks for thinking that I maybe have something important to say. It's beautiful, man. We'll see. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Thank you. Noah, thank you again, man. Such an incredible conversation. Thanks for sharing your heart. And thank you to everyone who made it through our two hour and 10 minute or so conversation. Hey, if you'd like to be part of the About to Break live experience, we are doing our first live show. Again, it's at the Loft on 2nd on May 10th. It's a Wednesday evening. Tickets are available. Tickets start at just $10. And you can get those at the aboutttobreakpodcast.com. Go grab them now while they're still available. Again, aboutttobreakpodcast.com.